Um, and I said, I kind of feel out loud. It's not hard to know how I'm feeling about something because you'll either see it on my face uh, or I'll tell you or I'll talk about something and you can kind of know, oh, wow, he's really exposed right now. I, I think they don't think that, you know, they don't think exposure. They think he's really sharing true like feelings right now. And I think I do that pretty well. And I, the reason why I say I think I do it pretty well and I feel out loud is because I don't know I'm doing it. I, I usually catch myself feeling too vocally. Um, not, I don't say too vocally, just vocally. Um, and I think feeling out loud is something that if we all did more of it, we would all, we'd have, probably have less altercation, less problems with interactions, because if someone's not feeling right, we can tell, we can, ex they can they, they're expressing that we can, you know, be there for them. We can give them the space they need. We don't try to trip over them. I wish you all a beautiful evening. Um, I hope you're all great. Thank you so much for being here already. Thank you much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have a great guest tonight. We have Didi here, an EA game changer, a veteran, um, and somebody who tries to make the world a better place. And you will see tonight why. And I'm super excited about that to tell you his story. Give you a little heads up. Um, what what I think? I think veterans are heroes. And they're the ones who, you know, you risk their lives for something bigger than themselves. And most of them come back um, and are not the same people. They try to connect to the people at home they didn't see for so long and, and they can't because they are not the same people. The people at home are not the same people. The family is, is not the same family. Friends sometimes don't longer exist because everything changed. So this is something big and we will talk about that tonight. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. Um, Didi, thank you so much for joining me tonight. How are you doing? I'm good. Izzy, thank you so much for, uh, having me on you, uh, on Twitter. And even, even here now you have, uh, you give me some lofty praise and appreciation. And I have, I feel like I have, a, I have to live up to that. And it's a high, it's a little bit more of a high bar than I'm used to. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't, uh, I don't see myself as so special. I do try to do whatever I can to make an impact in the world, but I mean, uh, we all should, every, every one of us should. Um, if there's nothing else you do with your day, just be a decent person to somebody else. And maybe that's, you know, uh, that's the, that's, that's the best you got. That's the best they might ever get. So but uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here, uh, and I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm actually very nervous um, because we we met this weekend and we kind of had a you know a really good long conversation about a lot of stuff that we were going to talk about. We had basically and it was very secret, valuable to me. A secret pre podcast, right? Yeah, like, guys, I'm I'm so sorry we didn't invite you guys and we didn't expect it as well. We said like let's have a quick chat, you know how everything will go, and then like I think two hours later we were still talking. We were it was two and a half. It was two and a half hours. And, and then it was just, it just kept going. We kept changing some direction and we kept, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and hopefully I don't bore anybody with two and a half hours of me talking clearly, but it was, it was very valuable to me. It was a great interaction. Uh, Mizzy had thrown some things at me that I'd never thought about, or I hadn't thought about in a certain way. Um, and I think to her as well. And I think that it was just very, um, I hate the word synergy, but it, it had some synergy to it. There was, you know, more product than there was more yield than there was, uh, you know, early substance. So uh, secret. <laughs> uh, how are you doing guys in the chat, by the way? Thank you also. Thank you all for being here. I hope you're all great. Kersley is here. Scream your chaotic is here. Bosch is here. Helmut is here. Cylon is here. Sluggish guys. You're amazing. Volpix. How are you doing tonight? So great to see you. Oh, it's Kelly. Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Oh, Kelly is here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I am. Um, um, so maybe let's let's just again, you know, I, I would like to say something up front. Um, thank you for your service. And this is really weird for me to say that every time I hear that because I'm German, and we do not say that here. But I know it's very important. And of course, I'm German and say that as a German is even 
more weird for me. Even though I know what you do is kind of affecting me and, and you, you're working for my freedom as well because it affects, affects us all. But it's still weird. Um, so how important is that for you that, that somebody recognize that what you do um, is that important? So I never, this is not a thing that, ever, that I ever heard before 9-11. Uh, I was in the army for several years before 9-11 happened. And so I was wearing a uniform and I, I never had someone thank me for my service, really. That was never a, people didn't do that. 9-11 changed the face of America and it changed the face of the world. Everything that's happened after that, it's been now 19 years, going to be 20 years here very soon, um, that the world has changed. And that's when I started hearing it. And the first time I ever heard it, was I was in an, I'd just come back from Iraq. I was, I'd taken some leave. I, the war had started. I came back from Iraq. I was going to work in my uniform, not in a combat zone for the first time, like in, in a long time. I was back in Hawaii. I got in my elevator. I was wearing my uniform. I had a combat patch, which says that I was in a, that I was in combat and I was going down the elevator and a very old gentleman, seventies, eighties years old. Uh, and he turned to me and he knew he saw and he shook my hand and he said, thank you for your service. And I didn't know what to say. No one ever thanked me for my service. And, uh, you know, it's like, do I say you're welcome? Because now it's like, now that feels very pretentious, right? That's like, no, I, I don't do this for the praise. I certainly never thought about that part of it. But my reaction was one of, um, thank you. It's like, it's, it's hard to respond, right? Um, and I think, and you'll find lots of veterans that struggle with how to respond to thank you for your service. Um, some people are, uh, for me now, I say, I appreciate that support. Um, for some people, I've heard them say now, it was my honor. And I think that that's a, that's a very awesome way to say it. Here's the fun thing about that guy in the elevator, though. He was a three-time Vietnam veteran. He had three tours in Vietnam. Wow. And here he was shaking my hand, thanking me for my service which is something that no one ever did for that man. Mm -hmm. That is in that one moment, there's like so much to unpack there, but so that was history, the first time. Right. Oh, yeah. And such a different world. That's, that's interesting. And, and you said, I think you said before, like your family um, uh, were in Vietnam as well, right? Like uh, your father's father th I, served. Uh, so my, my dad was, my dad didn't serve in Vietnam, but he was, he was in the air force, uh, you know, just, just after that time, I think he was a little bit too young. Um, I had an uncle who, who had served in Vietnam in the Navy. I've had, uh, grandfathers, uh, Korean war, uh, and world war two. Uh, but I've, I had, I have, I've had a lineage of people who have served, but it's actually not many. I'm the only person of, oh, I have one other, one other cousin that is currently serving in the Navy 20 years after like my service, he's now serving the Navy. We have very few young people who have served in my family. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of unique. And now my, my, my one cousin, my youngest cousin is, is very unique because he's, he's just now graduating from the Navy. Interesting. Can we roll back a little bit? I would like to know, um, I would like to go back to the day. Um, I don't know, did you get enlisted or did you, did you get, like, yeah. did you, okay. How, 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 can you remember the day? How, how did that happen? Everything? Uh, it was January. I don't remember the exact day, but it was January of, uh, 1995. I turned 18 and I couldn't go to this. I couldn't go to basic training yet. because I had to finish high school. I had one more semester of high school. Um, but I could still, you could still enlist early. Mm -hmm. And so I, they call it delayed entry. So I turned 18 on January 7th. So January 7th, I turned 18. It might've been the 8th, the 9th that I was raising my hand saying, I want to go. Um, and my intention, my, my whole point about going to the military was because I grew up in um, like the, the Southern portion of Chicago in, in Illinois. And there wasn't a ton of opportunity there. I was quite poor. Um, and, you know, my, I didn't have a life as hard as many, but I didn't have a whole lot of options for, you know, we didn't have any money for college. I wasn't going to be able to go to college. I had friends of mine who uh, were talking about at what point they're going to be able to be managers at the McDonald's they worked at. And that was not interesting to me. I did not want to be the manager of a fast food joint. I did not want to do, 
Um, I just needed to find some way to get some education, to go to college, to, to have a vocation or something else. And so I went to the army. Um, some of it was just purely out of, I got to get out of here. And the other part of it was, I got to get away from my family who I absolutely love, but you're 18 years old. You don't always like your family. Yeah. Um, and I was the oldest of all of my niece, all my, all my cousins, all my, all my brothers and sisters. And I was just ready to go. So, uh, and then I, you know, during the summer I finished my graduated and then I went to basic training in the summer at the end of the summer, mm -hmm. 1995. Do you remember, did you, when you told your family, how, how did they react when you told them? Oh, Mizzy, I was an asshole teenager. They thought I was full of it. They, my, my mom and my grandmother to this day, my, my grandmother, I think thought I was going to go. But my mother, to the day that I left, bags, duffel bags in hand, picked up by the military guy outside of my house. Uh, and I walked and I, I hugged everybody goodbye. And my mom was still like, this is still a joke, right? You're never going to do this. Like, this is like, no one thought I was actually going to go. Okay. They thought I was, they thought I was like, I'm going to go for the army and you can't stop me. And they thought that I was going to like puff and puff and then say oh, i'm just oh you're right i'm not gonna go no no i got in that car and i left got on a plane landed in oklahoma and then my life sucked for the next you know five four months and of uh you know training basic so training right yeah how, how long did it take till you saw your family back then again because, or uh christmas i left uh because you know your basic training Yeah, basic training takes about eight, nine weeks. Um, and then, you know, your, your training after that is usually what's a little longer. Mm -hmm. Basic training is about two months or so. It feels like a year um, just because it's, you know, every single day, constant, you know, pressure and all of that. But um, I don't know if that's true, uh, Perky. There are worse places in Oklahoma, but for basic training, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was definitely interesting, um, especially because I was an artilleryman. So I was, you know, learning how to blow things up. But it got Christmas time. We had a, a short, a short break. And so I was able to go home and see everybody for Christmas. And I think I have pictures somewhere of me at Christmas in my uniform it, but with nothing on it. It's, it's bare bones uniform. And I look like a five-year-old wearing an army suit. But by the way, guys, <laughs> uh, because I see a question in here, you're always welcome. A reminder, you're always welcome to uh, send us questions here in the chat you know it's it's not only a conversation between me and Didi here I said that a lot of times before and I mean it so please if you have questions just post them in the chat we will pick up them whenever we have time so were the insults bad <laughs> the insults like uh what what they do what they, what they yell at you at the army so um here's the here's the thing so I had someone tell me the best piece of advice that I honestly, the best piece of advice I ever got before I left for basic training was you are going to be wrong. You will never be right. You are going to get it wrong. No matter how many times, you know, it's right. They are going to yell at you and till you're blue in the, till, till you're blue in the face. And it will never be about you. It doesn't matter what you did wrong or what you did right. Mm -hmm. Just don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, it's like, uh, I, I, uh, we could talk about this later, but I talk about, uh, my wife actually knows this now about me. I have a thing called, I flip a switch and it's about right. It's about basic training that I learned how to flip a switch, which is I'm me all the time. But if I have to do something that I'm not interested, that is very scary or hard or, um, stressful or gross or dirty, I flip a switch. I stop being me for a minute. I do the thing. I get it over with. I flip the switch, but I feel icky about everything I did. So I got off this cattle car and they park this. It's, it's literally the uh, it's a semi trailer mm -hmm. that's used to that's used to carry cattle and cows in the back of it. And there's a hundred guys all standing up with all of their backpacks and all of their duffel bags and gear. And they park you about two blocks away from where you're supposed to go. Big open parking lot. And they make you run from and they have a drill sergeant here and a drill sergeant here and a drill sergeant here every 20 feet there's a drill sergeant and you have to run in between them and they're yelling at you you're dropping things your bags are spilling open they're you know they're accosting you and i watched all of these grown men freak out cry uh, be like oh my god i'm so sorry and they're getting yelled at getting yelled at and me i flipped my switch before i got out of that truck i tunnel visioned to the end and i i heard 
all of these insults as I'm running. I, you're, what are you? You're too small. Who are you? What are you? Four eyes. You know, these things that they're screaming at you as you go. Mm-hmm. I barely heard any of them. And I got to where we were going and we all stacked our duffel bags and we're supposed to be all, they call it dress, right? Dress. Everything is supposed to be perfectly aligned. And we put them all in a line and then we stood there and then they came and they yelled at us and yelled at us and yelled at us. And they said, it's not right. And I said, ah, this is what he meant. It's never going to be right. And so we had to go restack them again while getting yelled at and then stand there again. And they looked at it and it wasn't right again. And I was like, aha, see, I know it, it looks really good to me. I don't know what they're seeing that I'm not seeing. And then we go stack them a third time. And finally they were like, that'll do pig. That'll do like they're So I, that's the, the only thing that saved me from that first day was that piece of advice, which was, you know, when, you know, Kelly's like, were the insults bad? Yeah, they were bad. But if you shut them off, you took them yelling at you. It wasn't about you. And it wasn't about degrading you so much as it was breaking you down to make you realize, look, you're an 18 year old kid that doesn't know anything about the world. And we're about to show you, you're about to wear a uniform and potentially have to fight and kill someone. We can't have you thinking that you know everything about the world. We can't have you thinking that you're just top dog and you can't tell me what to do. Everything that your mom always and your dad always yelled at you for. It's like, well, they were right. And you didn't listen. You're going to listen now. So that's kind of how that's kind of how that way. <laughs> it's a, definitely a real safe place. Absolutely real safe place. I just I just thought about uh, if you're that long in the military, you know, and you you pick up some habits. Is, is that kind of one of the the habits you picked up and you you still have? Like, are they are they good and bad habits? You say like I I have them now still in the civilian life, and what kind of habits are they? Smoking and dipping. <laughs> I talked about booze. honestly, yeah. <laughs> that, trust me, I mean, that those are smoking and dipping were the two things that just it's like they went hand in hand. And I don't know if it was just because you needed something else to do or something else to have control over, but yeah, I just in fairness, that's pretty much uh, it's almost a given that you're going to be doing things like that. It's but in terms of habits, good habits, um. I don't do them anymore, but I used to get up exactly when my alarm went off. My alarm would go off at 5.15 or 5.30 and I would get up, go immediately, mm-hmm. anytime, whether I was going to work or whether I was getting up for the day. And now maybe it's because I'm, no, I'm retired and I can do other things. Now it's like, ah, uh, 10 more minutes. I never did that. The army actually really did a good job of you know my entire career doing that. Um, so I want to go back to be able to jump up, but I also don't have a reason to, <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> That's interesting. <clears throat> um, I think I'm yeah, trying to think of another, I'm trying to think of another habit, like another thing that I, um, there's a lot of things that I learned, uh, like leadership wise, um, and you know, how to manage people and how to work well with people, how to, uh, it's where I, the military is where I started trying to perfect Personal. how to, how to make a change. Like, you know, if you think something should be a certain way, there's a lot of ways to tell somebody. I can say, Mizzy, your audio is terrible and it sounds like garbage and it does not. I, I'm just saying it sounds like garbage and I, 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 would, I would do this, I would do this, I would do this, right? Mm-hmm. Immediately, immediately you're defensive. You are like second guessing, like, hold on. What do you know more than I know? And well, I've already tried those things. So now it's more of, and this is all, this is all a point here is more, now when I engage somebody, I was like, hey, I'm hearing something in your audio, and I know that I've had that before too. Um, maybe, uh, have you taken a look at this? And if you haven't, that's fine. Like my way that I engage with information, I'm not trying to upset you. I am trying to help you. Mm-hmm. I think that it can be better. And if we agree that we can try this. So there's things like that that I pulled, again, from, mil- from military service and from learning how to be a leader and, and managing soldiers that um, you can get more out of people if you're not a douchebag when you, you know, you can really get people to work harder, make themselves better, want to be better. If you engage them as an app, as a real human with emotions and feelings, um, and you're not appealing to anything other than their sense of individuality. And, you know, I want to make you better. Can I help you make, can you, can I help you be better? That's, that's very interesting because I mean, it, it sounds like kind of like a contrast to me. If you say like, you know, you're in basic training, you get yelled at, you know, um, you have, you have basic, basically leadership assholes around you, but for a reason, but now you're saying over the time you learned not to be a douchebag in order to be a better leader. You know, this is, uh, 
this doesn't fit together, but it still makes sense, you know? What, what kind oh, of trust work? me, there's some there's some leaders out there that they really, they, they're like, nope, being a douchebag is the best way to be a leader. Watch this. And they get people to do stuff for them because they just, they're just, I'm going to be a bigger douchebag. Yeah. That's their leadership style is to be overbearing and brazen and pushy. And it just doesn't work for everybody. I, so. I just remember I had once, or, um, I had once, like I was applying for a job and when I came, came to the first uh, interview, you know, I stepped into the room. And the, the boss looked at the sheet with my name, you know, and he looked at me, he looked at the sheet, looked at my name, like, like, um, he said, like, yeah, you have a shitty name, your parents really hated you. And I looked at him like, what the fuck do you want, you know? <laughs> and, and then I stepped in and then he kept going like this, like for 45 <laughs> minutes, he was being an asshole for 45 minutes and I didn't react. You know, I was like, there's something behind that I don't see. So I just don't react, you know, well, if something is off here, you know? And then after he explained to me, he wanted actually to hire me because I didn't react. Um, but I said, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, but, but, but it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, what kind of other um, leadership skills did you learn? Or what? Uh, let's just say in, maybe in general skills, like um, what are the skills you say, like that really improved you as a person? You know, when we were talking this weekend, you... Um, you asked a different question, but it's very similar. And it was about, you know, how do you become a good leader? And we got into that part. This is where I think that comes from. Or you asked, I think you asked me, at what point did you change in terms of like how you interact? This was right about that. This was kind of, um, as, as, as somebody might understand, you like to think that you learn how to do something, anything, chopping wood, drawing, um, typing from someone who is an expert at that thing. You like to think that if you're going to be taught that the person who teaches you to chop wood is a lumberjack, the person that teaches you to type is a writer, the person that teaches you to cook is a, is a, is a chef, and that they're very good at that thing. Mm -hmm. The person that teaches you to be a leader isn't always good at it. And I learned how to be a good leader from having years and years of very bad ones. Because as someone who can take the bullshit and say, well, we're just going to do this and we can't change the situation and that person is a horrible leader, you then say, don't, don't ever do that when you're in charge. Don't ever do that when you're in charge. And so then when you finally become in charge and you're like, all those things that I've learned that I don't respond to as a person who's being led, don't do that as a leader. So I learned more about being a good leader from bad leaders. I had good leaders. I did. They were just fewer and far between. And I did learn things from my best leaders, but it was, I learned more from the bad leaders, more how to not treat people and how to not, um, you know, how to appeal. Like, uh, here's a great example. Every single soldier, every single human, every single person responds to different stimulus. For some people, if you do something wrong, speak, think of a child, some children, if they do something wrong and you scold them, they feel oh, you have power over me. I did something incorrect. I no longer want to feel like I do something wrong. So I will not do that wrong thing again, because you being angry with me is hard to me. There are some children that you're like, I don't care that you're angry with me. That just makes me more want to be, a, you know, that, right now there's some other children or some other just humans in general where it's like, Hey, can, can I ask you to tell me what's wrong? are you okay? Is this, or is everything going well? No. And so you realize, oh, the behavior was because of something else. Okay. Let's try to fix what's wrong so we can change that behavior. And then for other people, uh, my, 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 the one that works best for me a lot of times is I have a standard, you know what the standard is. You'd failed to meet that standard and you've disappointed me. Mm -hmm. And I have made, I have made grown men cry 200 and something pound big guys ball in their eyes because I didn't yell at them. I didn't, you know, I didn't make them do a bunch of push-ups. I didn't tell them that they were worthless. I didn't tell them that they, all I did was say, you know what you were supposed to do and you didn't do that thing and you disappointed me. And I found that that, we want to please people. We want to do good. And I think that's the, these are just ways that you learn to apply different stimulus to the people that are going to react to it. You know, not everybody responds to that though. That's very interesting because I think this, um, everything you said, um, we can apply for everything else in life. 
like we can learn from from stuff which is not going the right way we can learn from people who are not doing it the right way every day like uh, for example streamers we have a lot of streamers in here right so guys when you're watching a stream you know even though the stream is not good you can learn so much from just by watching it you know um when, when something is not going good in the game you know instead of complaining you can just say hey i learned something from it right so i think this is a this is definitely a valuable lesson um in general um let me let me get back a quick little bit i mean we are we are yeah. all in in the in the veteran veteran uh, section right now we i definitely want to talk about your your gaming life a little bit later but before i lose it here um wait we had that sorry <laughs> that's probably because i jump around a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah we jumped a lot that, that's totally fine um yeah a general question I, I was like i was interested like when you imagine going to the military did it actually fit your expectations in the end no mm -hmm. <laughs> i didn't you know like i think i i was an asshole teenager i was smarter than everybody around me now that's that's me saying i wasn't smarter than everybody around me i just thought i was but I was also a highly intelligent kid that wasn't challenged. I was not challenged in high school. I did poorly my last couple of years of high school because I got really bored. Um, I felt like I didn't have, I, I felt like I didn't have intellectual peers. I did have intellectual peers. I was just too much of an asshole to engage like that. And I, so I just, I, I reclused. I went and I, you know, most of my friends in my, my final years of high school were, some of them were dropouts. Some of them were, you know, into drugs and gangs and things like that. I, I found um, comfort in people that were less judgy of, I mean, I was a tiny little kid. I was a poor kid. I was, you know, I, I had uh, junky clothes. We didn't have all the nice stuff. And so I was, I was bullied and a lot of that stuff, but I was smart. And I kept wondering like, man, it's totally worthless to be smart because no one respects me being intelligent. They just, I'm not big enough. I'm not rich enough. You know, I don't have, I'm not a basketball star. I'm not a football star. I'm not good at anything like that. I was good at video games, but who, you know, who cares about that at that time? So I went to the army thinking, I'm going to get to the army. People are going to immediately give me respect because now I'm doing something better than they've ever done. And that'll show them. And the army is going to be easy for me because I am a strong guy and I am a powerful brain and I get there and I'm like, I don't know why this is, this is horrible. <laughs> this is a horrible place and I am not in charge and I do not know more than everybody. And they are telling me how dumb I am and showing me how dumb I am. And I mean, in, in real terms, it's like, you don't know anything about the world, man. Mm -hmm. You're, you're literally a, in, you're in almost an insignificant speck in the universe. And it's like, wow, you're right. And I had, there was like a lot of change from the years of eight, from 18 years old to 19 years old. My, that was my first major, I am not the, the smartest person in the universe. That was like, and we all know that we're not, but we have this ego that thinks, you know, ego helped me get by when I was being bullied. Ego helped me get by. It was a defense mechanism. When I got to the army, I realized that that defense mechanism was not going to be useful to employ, to learn, to do something like a new skill or a new trait. I had to just get rid of everything, leave it all, drop it all, change everything about how I operate and engage with the other humans. Um, otherwise, I would, I, would have, I would have washed out of basic training. There's no way you can complete, you can go through all of that and keep that, that high ego, a sense of, uh, sense, sense of self-importance. You have to get rid of it. How long did you serve again? Uh, 14 years. I disability retired um, and after 2010. So about 32, right? If I can count. Uh, you came home. I was, yeah, well, I was 35. I had a break in service. I, I got out, I got out of the army for one year and I went back in. Um, so yeah, I was, I was 30, it was May 33, I 33. Um, okay. I was done. I wanted to do other things. I, so I was, uh, I worked at one point, I was living in Hawaii. I'd been in the army for 10 years. Uh, I had uh, an opportunity to go and work as a civilian to do counterterrorism and intelligence. I was doing mm -hmm. counterterrorism and intelligence. I was, you know, helping people find bad guys and, and, and cancel them off the face of the planet. I had an opportunity to, I literally left my uniform on a Friday. Okay. I, I took my, took my uniform off on a Friday on Monday. 
I showed up in civilian clothes to the same place working for the guy that I trained to do my job. Mm -hmm. And so I switched and I did that for about a year, um, which was one of the most powerful years of my life. And I wasn't even like in terms of things that I did that I felt were important. Uh, and then after that, I decided, you know, I, I had been to Iraq already. I'd done all these things. And I said, you know, I do miss, um, I miss, I miss leading. I miss leading. I miss taking care of soldiers. I miss doing those, uh, those things. I, I miss being, um, I miss, I missed leading. I, I used to call it, um, creating, uh, creating, what did I say? creating smart humans. Like you, my wife is a first grade teacher. And one of the funnest things to see is you've got this six-year-old brain that comes into her classroom in the, in the start of the year. And when they're seven years old at the end of the year, they're so different. Their brains are so different. They've yeah. learned so many skills. They've yeah. like, they're like, I look at her, her first graders and she'll tell you, it's like, and you, well, you have, you have children. So you might, you might understand this from year to year, right? They start the year as a kid. They leave first grade as a little human mm -hmm. they're they're thinking things they're trying to figure things out their brains are different they're fun they're always wonderful but they're they're little thinkers so i used to want to create you know educated humans or better humans and i by doing that is you take someone who's 18 17 19 like i was you know give them all of the tools to you know give them what you've got to give them and, and help them become a better adult help them become a, a thinking you know, participant in society mm -hmm. in a uniform or out of a uniform. I just really enjoyed that process so much so that I almost went to back to go teach college after I got out when I, cause that was something that they were like, you should go teach college because that's where I can employ some of that 18, 19, 20 year old kids, right. That I can help and get them to engage their brain in different ways. I didn't take that route. I almost did, but I, I, I didn't take that route. So I went back for that opportunity. I went back in the service to do that same thing again. Then I went to Afghanistan, took some soldiers to Afghanistan, trained some more, uh, got sick in Afghanistan, came home, and I was forced to retire about a year and a half after that. So that was, yeah, you got sad, sick? sad days. Sick yeah. or injured? Sick. Okay. Um, where did you serve everywhere? Like Baghdad and Iraq? And yeah, well, I was, I was in Kuwait before the war started, and I, I got to Kuwait, and I didn't know we were going to war. And I, so everybody's like, how did you not know? Because I was living in Hawaii, focused on Southeast, Southeast Asian terrorism. My, I knew more about the Filipino government. I knew more about the uh, Malaysian government and the terrorism problem. Uh, I knew more about um, uh, Indonesia. I knew more about the archipelagos that were out there because I was focused, so hyper-focused. My day-to-day -day job um, was looking at and tracking terrorists in Southeast Asia. I couldn't tell you what was happening with, with George Bush and the United States and Saddam Hussein, not like maybe I saw a thing on the news or something, but I was not paying attention. So they sent me to Kuwait as an individual to go hook up uh, in Kuwait with a unit. And I got there. And within the first two weeks, I had some general come out and said, we're going to war, folks. Literally, that was his words. And I was like, we're what now? With, with whom? With why? How, what? Are we are we are we doing is this live? Are we live? Are we live right now? Like, are we doing it? And then three weeks later, we're rolling across the border um, into Iraq. So I was in Kuwait, then I was in uh, Baghdad uh, for quite a while, and then I came back to Kuwait before I went home. That was the um, Baghdad Bob story, right? Yeah. I was telling when Mizzy and I were talking. I said, do you remember Baghdad, Bob? And, and she said, no, but Baghdad wait, 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 was wait, there. Wait, wait, wait. Before, before we go in there, Chad, do you, know, do you know what Baghdad Bob means? <laughs> see. Does, does anybody know, remember who Baghdad Bob was? I, I want to wait a second because this was there's uh, little there's literally gifts for this no yeah well bloody you're a little bit too young i think and the one country boss should maybe remember but he doesn't No. boss should remember so i'll just say it like this maybe okay. you'll get this one there's no american troops in baghdad there are no american troops here there there's it's all smoke and mirrors there's no americans they they, they it's all you remember that guy that was their Ministry of Information. That was the Iraqi Minister of Information who was on the news all the time saying, nope, they're not here. Never. Nope. Nope. Uh, that's not a tank. That's not, that's nope, not that's a one tank. of ours. <laughs> yeah. You know? right. 
it was it was quite comical especially you know as you know before i went into iraq we kind of watched the first part of the ground war and this guy's on the television you know telling telling local iraqis ah they're nuts they're not here Mm -hmm. don't look at the man behind the curtain there you go it was the wizard of oz you know (laughs) so anyway I, i look do a do a do a gift search for baghdad bob and you'll probably see the guy i'm talking about standing at the baghdad international airport saying nope no Americans here. <laughs> so that was, that was a interesting world. So it's funny because I kind of lived that guy's life. So I'm like, I don't really, <laughs> Al Ashahaf, is that his name? I have that no might idea. be it. That might, somebody just put it I in I can't Google right now. I will, I will crash my CPU. Yeah, right. I, I try not to touch my computer right now. So everything runs smoothly. I hope this stream runs smoothly, guys. And this is the first night I stream everything by myself. So um, this this is why I am a little bit extra nervous, and that's why we had the break as well because we had like a technical change in the background. Um, so that's why we didn't stream for a few weeks. But we are back today. All right, so far so good. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, can you can you tell us some things you remember about most about your um, um, deployment there? Um, so Iraq or Afghanistan? Well, let's stop with the first one where you were first. Um, um, let's go. For Iraq. That. So 2003, ground war, uh, Iraq was the wild, wild west. There, it was not anything like any movie, any war movie that I had ever seen before. Um, there was very, a lot of cavalier attitudes, a lot of, uh, I don't want to say a lot of John Wayne type uh, bravado. There was still hard stuff happening there, but I think we didn't, this is this is me as an American soldier in Baghdad thinking we did not at all respect, appreciate the Iraqi regime at all. Now I'm not saying I'm not I'm not sorry for that, because they were a sorry ass bunch of assholes treating their people like crap. So let's just get that clear. So I'm gonna say he was a bad guy. But they were not a like we decimated their army. They either capitulated before we even started. They, which means they just walked away and left mm-hmm. their tanks there or we exploded them. There was no army left to fight. Per, you know, they, we trust me, we fought people. There was definitely a fight, but not like battalion of tanks versus battalion of tanks gone going for, mm-hmm. you know, for long hours. And, you know, there was no World War II battle of the bulge type stuff happening there. There was definitely battles. The change there was insurgency. And for us, insurgency, the last time American soldiers had seen insurgency was Vietnam. That's where things changed for us. We went from, you know, we threw our tanks and our planes at Iraq and we walked over Iraq. We were up in Baghdad, and I think, in 11 or 13 days. I mean, that was not a a hard push. In terms of a war, we wrecked wrecked their their military. Mm -hmm. But the insurgents, like insurgency is, is a whole different ballgame. Um, that's where I realized this is not because this is the first time that I think I want this. I'm at war. My grandfathers were in war. I've had you know other people that I know that have been to war. This was like no other war I think anybody had ever seen. But then came the insurgency, and it's like, oh, this is a war like no one's ever seen. Like now, I the the hard part about what we were doing and what we we're what even what's still happening in Iraq and Afghanistan wasn't necessarily the force on force. It was dealing with insurgencies, being a transplanted soldier there to do a good thing, now seen as an occupier and having to work with people and gain their trust where they're not sure who to trust anymore. The last guy was really bad. You guys have a lot of guns and you're really forceful. We don't really know who to trust. So we kind of, so all of that to say, my takeaways from Iraq was it was kind of a new environment for for combat it was a new environment for soldiers to be placed in um it was a new environment i think for civilians to be occupied in it wasn't like you know world war ii europe it wasn't like uh you know the Viet Cong and 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 the north vietnamese it wasn't this was very different and uh because of that all of our books that have trained us for counterinsurgency operations and terrorism kind of had to relearn a lot of that stuff there's a lot of soldiers that left iraq and are helping to write instructional manuals of how to deal with a post-regime change era in a country of a a dictator because it ain't it's not easy Mm -hmm. (laughs) you can't just you can't just go in there destroy their army 
get rid of the bad guy and then say, all right, there you go. We We did it. We did it. We did it for you. Good luck. You know? In fact, I had Iraqis. Remember, we, you and I talk about a, a young yeah, Iraqi Nemi. boy that I, that I worked with. Nemi, yeah, Nemi. And Nemi, uh, I had I had it in my head. He had it in his head that we were going to be that they were, Iraq was going to be a state of the United mm-hmm. States. They like that's I what think, he thought. I think I remember that I was studying <clears throat> politics at that time actually, and I think I remember that we were discussing about like um, I, I should I had to write an essay about which kind of. Um, you know, system would be best for Iraq actually to put there. Um, and, and this is what he was expecting too, right? He expected like a presidential system like in the US now in Iraq or, or what did Dummy say? What what did he expect? What were his expectations? Um, ne- so like we're just a little background. Nemi was a, uh, a young man, um, 22, maybe 23 um, in Iraq that I met uh, who spoke English. He'd been to the university in Baghdad, he, you know, until it was, until they weren't able to go anymore and Saddam said they couldn't go. So he had an education. He learned English. He had, he, he knew, um, it's one of the bad, one of the things I say about, uh, uh Americans versus, you know, people in, in other countries, uh, especially Europe. Um, I've met people from Europe that know like 15, 16, 17 different languages, enough to, enough to order and enough to ask for directions and help out. Nemi could probably speak four or five different languages enough to converse. Which and is I can amazing. speak one. Yeah. Um, and so Nemi was very helpful to me, but he thought, and all his friends, like he was, he'd have four or five guys working with him. And he's like, so are we going to become a state now? Mm-hmm. Like, like, like Wyoming, you know, they, that's, you know, is Iraq going to be another state? <clears throat> and clearly at, like, even me, I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think that's how this works. Mm-hmm. I was like, I, I'm pretty sure that you guys are just going to, you know, be able to make <coughs> this country. <laughs> Sorry. Here's my, <clears throat> no, me too. Here's my, um, I think, I think what I said it to him at one point was I said, I really think that we removed the bad guy. Nobody likes Saddam. Nobody, they were like, ah, do not like that. They were all living under fear and oppression. Even, even the people that supported them really were only supporting them. So they didn't get killed or, you know, like they're just going along with it, you know, for that. But they thought, um, or I, I thought now you guys will have an opportunity to come together form a democracy and grow because it's that simple, right? Well, it's, it's not yeah. that simple at it's all. It's not that simple, especially, I mean, we are talking about a completely, this is a big change <clears throat> which needs time. You can't just, and this is the main issue. You can't just put a, put another system on a country, you know, and then, and say like, hey, well, now you got to deal with it. You know, um, can you tell me that story about Nemi? Like the, the main issue for you was communication, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, can can um, you tell tell me that story again? Because this is also something which I think shows where the main issue is. Well, what it's was. main issue for. <clears throat> <clears throat> so there's a lot. There's a lot of takeaways here. I'm sorry because all this. I, I have like the the throat I have tea. stuff. I hate it. I have tea. I have I have this. I don't. It's garbage. No, it doesn't. It's help. not. It's actually really good. <laughs> um. So yeah. So there I was. Uh, I was. There I was. No shit. No lie. I was in Baghdad. <laughs> Uh, I was, you know, a very young staff sergeant, E6. I uh, was on a liaison team. So it was a very interesting uh, situation. I was living in a palace that had, we didn't blow up, but we blew up some things around it. I got to live in a palace for, you know, three months or so when I was in, in Iraq uh, with big, you know, it was covered in dust and covered in, you know, everything was, you know, wrecked and destroyed, but it was marble floors and high ceilings and gold laid stuff and opulence. You know, Saddam Hussein's palaces were opulent. There was it. Uh, it reminds me of if you guys ever played Destiny Two and you like have the Levite, a very unreal. Like, well, right. no, the rest of the country looks like garbage because he treated it like garbage. Mm-hmm. But his palaces were opulent. Yeah, so of course. If you that's ever, what I mean, living yeah, there. You, oh, like... for sure. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Destiny, yeah. I cut you off. Do you guys remember Destiny and what? Oh, well, and like Ber- Berlin Jim here says that he's a madman who believed he was the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. I think so. Totally different story. If you guys ever want to hear it, you can come talk to me afterwards. I've actually been to Al Hala, and Al Hala is uh, where he had built two towering uh, mounds with a, you know, he had Uday and Kus- uh, Hussein, and they had. Uh, palaces built for his sons and that is sitting on top of historical babylon and i've been to babylon and he destroyed archaeologically everything that below the surface mm-hmm. just to dredge river like to, all about ego 
destroyed thousands of years of civilization and things that we could learn from. That's that's who that's the guy we're talking about. So he's on there. Um, so yeah. So uh, if you ever played Destiny, Destiny Two, and you have the Leviathan raid, right? And you got to go fight Callus. You know how you're fighting Callus, and as you're going through the Leviathan, it's gold inlaid with beautiful, um, uh, you know, statues and things made of, you know, shiny coppers and golds and inlays everywhere. That's kind of what it was like at the palaces. And then you go outside the palaces, and it's like brown buildings with dirt roads and and or and dirt you know dirt lawns and it's everybody it's such, such a disparity between being a rich general in the military or someone of you know saddam hussein's influence living in these palaces to right next door living in garbage town yeah just interesting definitely so yeah Back but the nemi. uh yeah nemi sorry nemi um again so i, I had nemi uh he was working with me with these these gentlemen and they would give us uh, we were paying Iraqi, uh, young Iraqi men to come and do uh, some labor for us around, you know, we'd have them uh, help us build things, help us move things. We, d- we gave them jobs because uh, we had a bunch of just, dis- the country was in disarray. One of the best things that we could have done at the time was give them a little bit of money and give them a little bit of occupation. Uh, at least that way, we're seen as not trying to come in and, all right, go home and wait two years until everything's over, because nobody can do that. We're doing it in a, in a pandemic right now. People, you know, you can't, you can't tell people to go home and wait a year and until it's all better. Um, you have to find some things to do. So we were using them. We were employing them, uh, whether it was, you know, uh, you know, cleaning up, you know, people, we had people to, to work clean up. We had people to help build stuff. We had people to help fix stuff. And so I was given uh, a group of about seven or eight young Iraqi men. And Nemi was not the, he wasn't the leader among them, but he was the one that could speak English. So he became a de facto go-between. Um, And that was great. And we learned a lot. We sat together. They would ask Nemi questions to ask me questions. I would ask Nemi questions to ask them questions. And it was a very fun exchange of information. Um, And then uh, bureaucracy showed up and the military, the U.S. military formed a contract with a Iraqi company that then said all of these workers now work for that company. And so I had to go to a big boss man to say, I need seven you know, seven, seven persons. I need seven Iraqi, Iraqi men to come and help. And he would, he would pick them out. And so I was like, no, I want that guy, Nemi and those other guys. And he said, well, you can't have that guy. Cause I say, so I was like, well, that's not how this is going to work. And then they gave me a manager. As I, I was mentioning to you, they gave me a manager. Uh, and this manager came from a, he was from a rich background. So he had like some Royal blood or something, or he was just a, he was part of an aristocracy, mm-hmm. right. In Iraq. So what's the guy had? Yeah, it's still there. He had no education. He'd never been to college and that's fine. Like, but he had, he could speak no English. How can you manage people on a team and working with another uh, country and not be able to communicate? There were zero ways for me to communicate. And so I said, if you don't give me Nemi, nothing will get done. Mm -hmm. This guy does not speak English. And so we brought him with us and it was so frustrating because I would, the guy was like, uh, you know, I want, he'd tell Nemi, that I want this done. Nemi would tell me, this is how we're going to do it. And I'd say, no. (laughs) And I have to go back through Nemi to tell this guy to tell his crew. And it was so frustrating because Nemi was the guy. He wasn't rich. He was poor. He was educated. He was a smart young man. And why couldn't we just, anyway, all of this to say it was so frustrating in a war zone, a post, we thought it was post-war. We still had, you know, clearly 10, 15 years we were going to be in Iraq. I thought, that stuff would be cast out. Instead, we let it rear its ugly head and all sorts of bad decisions, you know, made in the wake of, I mean, it was chaos. When I say it was the wild, wild west, my time in Iraq, 2003, wild, wild west, because it was all very cavalier. And man, we just, if we were to go back, if, if I was to go back and do it all again, obviously, you know, hindsight's 2020, but we just operated as if there wasn't going to be a problem. No, we we won, right? Mission accomplished. We we won. It's all fine now. It was never going to be fine. This was not, you know, we couldn't do it that way. You can't just upset. You can't just take out the bad guy and think, "Good luck. You guys are going to get this. Yay, we'll be here for like another 6 months." Exactly. Just kidding. Mhm. Yeah. Um 
it's it's really weird like let's go further um i mean i think the the question we had where we start was like what are things you will remember most about your deployment right mm -hmm. um what what else do you remember well first off uh apparently kelly called me princess deity and zadira would save me from bowser which i think is wonderful because <laughs> some i don't know if i i don't know if i'd make a good princess i'm too bald uh but <laughs> i i appreciate that i'd be saved from bowser <laughs> We can get so a wig sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I've worn a wig. I could, we could do that. We could do that. Um, can you ask your question again? Sorry, I thought it was fun. Uh, well, what do you remember most about uh, your deployment? And we said we start with Iraq, um, and then go further, right? I think. You oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, Afghanistan was very different. Afghanistan uh, mm -hmm. was about. I went to Afghanistan three years later, so I was 2006. I was in Afghanistan. We'd be, we'd been in Afghanistan for at that point four years. Um, I was uh, oh I was OEF six I think. What what so that was OEF uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. Okay. So that's you know it's what we called the the when we went in to Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, to to kill the to, to get the Taliban and find Saddam Hussein or um sorry Osama bin Laden, we uh, we called that Operation Enduring Freedom, mm -hmm. uh, and so I was the fifth or sixth rotation of Operation Enduring Freedom. So I was in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a very different country, with um a very different, uh, they don't have an army. They don't, they don't have tanks and planes like, um, uh, like the, the Iraqis mm -hmm. used to before we blew them all up. Uh, they have, uh, the Taliban and, you know, they've spent the last, you know, three decades before, uh, fighting Russian, uh, oppression and, 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 and insurgency as well. Right. The Northern Alliance and the folks that, you know, they, they'd been at war in many different ways. They'd been at war with, uh, people from Pakistan, because the the the, um, the tribes of Afghanistan and Pakistan really don't have borders, even though we draw borders on a map, that doesn't mean that border exists for those tribes that don't care about what we write on the map. Um, Afghanistan sorry, sorry was, to cut you, cut yeah. you there. Do yeah. you think like a retrospective, you were prepared for that kind of fight? Because I heard many times like uh, Afghanistan was a really difficult, because of the Taliban and the Russians and the experience, it was kind of a different kind of war. Oh, yeah. Right. Do you feel like you yep. were prepared for that? I think we thought we were because we like to think we're better than the Russians and everything we do um, because America is always going to do that. There's there's Mrs. Deity. My wife just showed up in chat. Um, <laughs> okay. But we were we uh, we like to think that we're better than the Russians at everything. So we knew we like we talked about before we even got to Afghanistan. We talked about, well, here's things the Russians did wrong. The Russians could not beat this you know people throwing rocks russians had big big uh, you know helicopters and tanks and they had all this firepower but they lost they couldn't they couldn't do what they wanted to do to a bunch of poor people with rocks right how does that work out and mm -hmm. so we said well we will learn from from their failures and we will not treat these people like this and we will engage them differently and sure that might have been a great concept but uh, we were probably as unprepared to go into afghanistan as we were Iraq for different reasons, like Afghanistan terrain wise, they have one road and that, that whole, the whole country has like one road that goes kind of all around. It's got, they have other roads, but one main highway, where do you take tanks? You don't. So we didn't really take any tanks. They have uh, no open air or, or open ground with which to travel over. So you don't take a whole lot of ground vehicles either. So we had like everything you do in Afghanistan, you're flying. I have so many hours in a helicopter. It's not funny because that's literally everything you do is by air in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. There's very little. There are that you do. There are convoys. They do have Humvees. They you know they do have uh, some some form of of ground support, but it is so few and far between. Because in order to get anywhere in a mountainous, you know, harsh terrain, you fly over it. It's the only way to really do it. And then they shoot at you while you fly over it. So it's a very different place. The one thing I will say about Afghanistan, though, is it's gorgeous. And people always are weirded out when I say from the air, it is people don't understand that it's not a big desert. Like they think of it. They're like, oh, Afghanistan, it's just a bunch of sand. I'm like, no, that was Iraq. Iraq was a bunch of sand, 100 percent bunch of sand. Afghanistan, northern mid to northern Afghanistan rolling hills 17,000 foot mountain peaks forests for days rivers absolutely gorgeous from beautiful, the air right yeah absolutely I saw pictures beautiful as well it's it's really different than iraq it's it looks amazing actually still yeah 
we started with uh, things you remember the most. Um, oh yeah, see, we're sorry. getting. I'm sorry. I'm, this, I'm, I'm bad. Me. I'm bad. It was me. No, it was me. I cut you off. I cut you off because I wanted to ask a little bit about. <laughs> That, but yeah, yeah. I will I will bring us back. <laughs> things things that I remember most about Afghanistan um, <clears throat> was uh, the the what I remember most about Af Afghanistan was the the difference. You know, Perky Daisy. Uh, interesting enough. So if you guys don't know who Perky Daisy is in chat, uh, so first off, Mrs. Deity is Mrs. Deity. Um, Zadira and uh, as it knows and uh, Perky Daisy knows, but Perky Daisy is my counterpart at Stack Up. Uh, so she is the other influence relations manager. So we we work with folks for Stack Up. Um, we didn't know this, but she was in the exact same place that I was in Afghanistan, uh, like two years apart. Oh wow! We only okay. we only found that out this year. Like we both we know we were both in the army. We know that we both were in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but we were in the same uh, forward operating base, Salerno. Spooky. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we were in the same place. So it's called Rocket City USA is what we called it because they would fire rockets at us all the time. Mm -hmm. So is that so what I remember about Afghanistan probably would be the rockets because I got shot. I got shot at by Scud missiles when I was in Kuwait. I got shot at by bullets when I was in Iraq and I got shot at by my rockets fired from afar with no targeting system because trust me, the Taliban are really good at being really bad at stuff. So they they can take rockets that don't have a tube to shoot through. They can take the backs off, wire them up to a battery and a timer, and have the rockets launch off of a couple of rocks. Like they lay them up against rocks, and then they're aiming them. They're like, uh, I think it'll hit over there, and then they go off. Rocket shoots off, lands somewhere about there, and maybe does some damage. So that was. Uh, <laughs> I kind think that's much what I remember. <laughs> Oh, Damn. this is like, uh, how, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with something you can't uh, Very poorly. predict? You know, like it, it sounds like a war you can't predict. It's like we're doing something, but we don't know what we do, right? Is that the main issue then? Was that the main problem in Afghanistan that it was not predictable? Um, well, so that's the whole thing is predictive analysis. I worked, I worked in counterterrorism and intelligence. So my entire job was to try to, at every point in my, my career is, is to figure out what the bad guys were going to do, where mm -hmm. they were, where they were planning, how they were going to carry it out. Um, and that was always very difficult because it changed from Sunday to Saturday. I mean, they, you, you think you have it down. You're like, Oh, we know exactly how they did that one. That means the next time they're going to do it the same way. No, no, they're, they're, they, the reason why that they were, they've been so successful is they're not dumb. I think that's probably that was probably our biggest mistake is going into and not everybody thought this, but a lot of people thought this. You go into Iraq or you go into Afghanistan and you fight these people um, and you, you think that the bad guys are dumb. You don't consider everybody mm -hmm. as an intelligent human being. They may not have my education. They may not have my background. They may not have gone to school for as long as I did but they are very technically savvy. Mm -hmm. They are very, they don't have all of the other distractions that we do. So when they don't have a lot of that stuff, you can easily train someone how to uh, tac tac tactically maneuver. Uh, these guys, oh my gosh, we didn't really expect the fact that we would go and get aggressed by someone and then go chase the bad guys and then lose them in the rocks and the mountains because they were wearing uh, brown clothing that, was very um, earth toned mm -hmm. and they would bring a little blanket with them and they would sit in, in 80, 90 degree weather with a blanket over them and they'd sit still for two, three hours and eat M&Ms mm -hmm. or little pieces of, of uh, you know, like a trail mix mm -hmm. so that we'd never see them again mm -hmm. because we're not going to go up that mountain and look, you know, we're looking for people that are wearing uniforms. We're looking for people that have, you know, flags and patches. That's what we're used to. We weren't used to that. And they're better at it than we are. They've been doing it for, you know, 40, 50 years. So um, I, I, that's... I was just saying, right? How did you not expect that? I mean, there was the Russians were before that. They did the same thing, right? How because we're better because we're better than the Russians, Mizzy. That, that's the the idea is that we're better than the Russians. So <laughs> clearly we're never going to fall prey to their mistakes. I feel I ask stupid questions <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, 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 you don't. That's the thing is that's that that's. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and, and to, for some things, it's true, right? We do, we, we do have some things, we have a better handle on some things than the Russians did. And so we, we went into it with a different mindset, but we still fell prey <laughs> to the same old shenanigans. Mm -hmm. We underestimated 
their resolve. We underestimated the fact that they know. That's one thing that I think that people don't understand about war in today's world. They know that eventually, no matter what happens, we will leave. They will not. Mm -hmm. And they are very, very, very patient. Mm -hmm. When they get impatient, they blow something up, but they are very, very patient. When the Russians left, the Taliban felt, you know, they were, hey, we got a whole country to ourselves. We won. We're good. We outlasted them. That's something that we're, we're still very worried about now. You know, we're going to eventually leave Afghanistan with the last boots on the ground. And we probably need to. It's, we're not going to really do, we're not going to make any headway in terms of turning that into some first world uh, superpower. That's not going to happen. Nor do we really want to create more superpowers of the world. They're right next door to two maybe three nuclear countries. Hmm. They border three, actually, sorry, they border three, maybe four, because we don't know what Iran has, Russia, uh, freaking China, uh, Pakistan, where they're, they're literally right next door to three nuclear nations. What can we do there? <laughs> the, so now that's me. This is not like, and I just want everybody to know too, that's, that's Sean pontificating on, you know, my thoughts there, this is not like a stack up thing or any of that stuff. It's more just, we have to leave. And they are, so because of that, I think a lot of soldiers and, and folks that get stationed over there are a little jaded. We don't, we don't feel like we're making a difference anymore. So. Hmm. Was it worth it for you? Or do you think it was worth it that you have been there? Did you change anything to be better? In Iraq, I saw, in southern Iraq, I saw Safwan. Um, and Safwan, when I went in there, these were the poorest of the poor people. I, I don't, these were people that they, they had onion and tomato farms, and that's pretty much all they had, growing it in brown dirt with very little water, and they were so poor. Um, they might have had, a, they might have had structures to live in, but this was the most, um, depreciated value of a person in a country that I could see. And then as you move closer to Baghdad and you have all of this affluence and it's all centralized, right, to this one, you know, area. And it was a clear disparity between the haves and the haves nots. Mm -hmm. Now we have that in every country. We have the haves and the have nots, but it was so bad. Uh, Saddam Hussein had killed hundreds of thousands of his own people, gassed yeah. his own yes. people. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me, do I think we made a difference? We absolutely made a difference in Iraq. We, were, we removed a, not just a dictator, we removed a monster. Mm -hmm. We removed a monster. Does that mean he's the only monster there? Probably not. Like, likelihood is not, but maybe they have a chance, maybe going forward to not see 200,000 people gassed, you know, uh, entire marshlands drained starved starving and, and starving your people and dehydrating your people until they die you know of, of that that's what he was doing in that country and i in afghanistan i i cannot say that i think we made the impact that we would have liked to make i think we have made an impact in the region i think we made an impact with some of the tribes that were there because the one thing that people don't understand about afghanistan is it's not one people Afghanistan is not a country of one people, right? Any more than uh, America is a country of Texas, right? Or, you know, of, of Texans. I mean, we, there's very different ideologies, but even more so, there are different languages in Afghanistan. There's more languages in Afghanistan than Pashto and Urdu. Huh. <laughs> like people are like, oh, well, you there's just Pashto, Urdu, and Arabic. Wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I told you about those little tribes yeah. that... That they're migratory tribes. They travel with grazing. They've got their sheep. They've got their, they, they literally trap their, their, their caravan pilgrims that, that move from spot to spot. How can you do anything in a country that you don't even understand how the peoples of that country? Live I think we did do culturally. some good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all worried about crossing the Pakistani border. These guys are crossing the Pakistani border every single day because they don't care about what the border is, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, I think we made, we, we have made headway. We have worked with some of these, um, you know, tribes that are out there and I'm no expert. Once upon a time, I was a little bit more of an expert 
uh, I know that we did some good work there. Uh, our med caps that were out there are people that were doing um, like we would a med cap is where you take all of your medical personnel, you go set up, put up a big, a big tent, all the kids come, you know, they give, we give them the polio vaccinations, we give them, you know, we check for rabies, we, we try to treat injuries, we try to treat, um, you know, things that they've had. And it's a it's like a goodwill thing that you do for them. Uh, and I think so I think there is some headway that's made there. In terms of regional stability or anything else, probably not. By the way, uh, vaccination, I don't know, as somebody said in the chat before, like, uh, I'm wondering um, how, I don't know, how, how in these countries, I don't know which country she said or he, um, they're doing right now with COVID. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that too. I, I, are, are, are they said are the, is the Taliban um <laughs> uh, yeah, the Taliban are locked out? Okay, I thought, I thought in general, but, <coughs> but actually I was wondering as well, like, <clears throat> how, how are they doing over there like in you know don't know don't Nobody know knows, right? i mean i mean i know that uh i know that our service members are masking and uh quarantining they're still carrying out their operations but i i know that our, our Amer uh, the american service folks that are over there are uh because i get pictures and i see we see yeah, pictures yeah. of mm -hmm. um and and covid did affect them too it affected our supply crate program uh mm -hmm. to to a point like uh when you know getting sometimes we had to we were always saying hey if we send you a supply crate send us pictures back. Mm -hmm. We've said several times, we're like, hey, we can't get everybody together for a picture because we're on different shifts and we're not able to be in the same room together. And so it has, but as far as the Taliban, I have no idea. I, I, I wish I did. Well, the Taliban, <clears throat> I don't know, but I was wondering more about the population and how they're doing over there. Um, well, do you guys, are you still in contact with your friends from the army? Sometimes. Uh, for some of them, I have a couple of them that are, you know, Facebook friends. We're 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 not close. We're distant. I did. I mean, I I've known. I've had more friends that I've lost in the military uh, than I care to count. And not all of them to suicide or anything like that. But some I've known people that I've deployed with uh, that are no longer here. And you know, I get tired suicide of opening during up. the service or after. During and after. During and after. Um, yeah, I I know a couple of folks that. Uh, I know, I know, I know of one person that before we deployed didn't want to deploy and uh, was too afraid to do it. And uh, whatever reason they did it, but they took their life before we deployed. Uh, this last time when I went to Afghanistan, I knew another guy that uh, we'd been back for a little while. He didn't deploy with us, but uh, you know, he was going through some other things and he took his own life. It was a guy that I literally saw day to day, every you know, every day when I went to work. Um, but I, I have a, I have a loose relationship, I you know, with, with some of them, but I do have one that. Well, a guy that I took with me in Afghanistan, I promoted him uh, to become a sergeant. I trained him. We called him my prodigal son. You know, I, I had a lot of faith in this guy. He was super smart. And he did. He, I, I wanted him to follow in my footsteps, not for any legacy reasons, but I thought that he could do it very well. Mm -hmm. And he did. And when I, when I had to retire, my next position was going to be the first sergeant of the MI company. Um, so the military intelligence company, I was going to be their first sergeant. And that is a very prestigious thing. Um, and that was my next thing to do. I had to retire. They forced me to retire. So he called me during COVID. He called me like, I would say last September and or maybe August and said, hey, I'm getting promoted. I'm going to go be the first sergeant in the MI company. I'd like you to come out there and see me. And so I, it was bittersweet because I got to go see him uh, get promoted to the job that I wanted him to have. But that was supposed to be my job. <laughs> so it was like, oh no, I didn't get to get it, but he did. So I was very proud and very happy of him. I was very, it was very so thoughtful for him to think about me. So it was a lot. <clears throat> um, because we are here right now, <coughs> we we started with the title "How to Feel Out Loud," and I mm. um I like that sentence. You said that in our secret pre podcast. Um, what does this sentence mean to you? And um, yeah, let's start with that. Where does it come so this, from? <clears throat> this is something I literally said to Mizzy, like on accident. You ever just thrown words out there that mean something, but you don't know why you put them together? Mm -hmm. We were talking about how um, I, I think myself to be a very compassionate, um, empathetic person, much more so than I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. I mean, always on that, 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 um, trying to grow, trying to be a better human, um, but more better of a human I could be in this world. Maybe I, I, I affect someone else, but I, I, I mentioned to Mizzy that I was like, I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve that, that term where people are like, you're very exposed and you get very attached and you're, you're, um, you don't, I'm not very steeled away. 
Um, and I said, I kind of feel out loud. It's not hard to know how I'm feeling about something because you'll either see it on my face uh, or I'll tell you or I'll talk about something and you can kind of know, oh, wow, he's really exposed right now. I, I think they don't think that, you know, they don't think exposure. They think he's really sharing true like feelings right now. And I think I do that pretty well. And I, the reason why I say I think I do it pretty well and I feel out loud is because I don't know I'm doing it. I I usually catch myself feeling too vocally. Um, not I don't say too vocally, just vocally. Um, and I think feeling out loud is something that if we all did more of it, we would all we probably have less altercation, less problems with interactions. Because if someone's not feeling right, we can tell we can ex they can they they're expressing that we can you know, be there for them. We can give them the space they need. We don't try to trip over them. We did, we all, yeah. We, I, so Zadira, she brings up this point. We played this game called Gris. A couple years ago, I had surgery on my hands. Uh, we, I, I wasn't able to play first person shooters. I was very depressed. It was very bad. I needed the surgery really badly. I streamed the next day uh, and I, because I can, I had my hands wrapped up and I had you know, I couldn't do a whole lot mouse and keyboard, but I had, I could do like WASD. And so we found some games to play on stream. And one of them was a game called Gris, um, which if you, if you know the game Gris, it is a wonderful game that uh, I, I think it has a lot to do with uh, um, femininity, loss, loss, you know, all of those things that can take place. And so for, for, a, for a male playing this, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to just kind of feel what I'm supposed to feel here. They do a good job because the game goes through situations where the colors change, the music changes. I have to tell you that at the end of this game, I still don't know what I was supposed to get, but I did cry live on stream. I was very emotional and people, yeah, so you see, so people do remember. And I think some of you people do know, I'm kind of a sap. I said that to Mizzy this weekend. She's like, sap, what is that? And I was like, oh, I'm emotional. Mm -hmm. I just, I, my, so when I say I feel out loud, I think, and I think I only know that I do that because of streaming, honestly, because I think you get, you, some of you guys remember when we did, because uh, people, some, some people here do remember, I did, uh, we answered our questions for our adoption questionnaire uh, and I did mine live. I spent three or four hours answering every question and I asked the chat the question and then I, I gave my answer because you can't lie to yourself when you're looking at yourself. You can't lie to yourself when you're as a camera looking at not like it's easy to call somebody's bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, so you can't do that. So I had to answer some of these questions and some of them are really hard questions. Give me an example. That, and by the way, I need to get up quick and get my charger for my laptop. Otherwise I won't yeah. see the chat. I hear you. I'm right back. Yeah. I'm right here. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, so what, like, for instance, uh, when you're adopting, these kids are coming out of different forms of trauma. These kids have even just being separated from their birth parent is a form of trauma. Um, some trauma is, is, is har more harsh and different. Uh, some of it, you know, whether it be, you know, physical abuse or sexual abuse or mental abuse and going through that list, you had to say, uh, can you or would you would you entertain uh, adopting a child that's been through X, Y, or Z trauma and to, and to what degree? Mm -hmm. Like one, two, three, four. And for example, I, I think we talked about uh, a certain type of sexual trauma. And I said, oh my God, of course. But then I had to reel myself back a little bit and say, if the level of trauma that they've experienced requires a certain type of uh, support that I can't give, then I can't help that child. And I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to, it would be disingenuous and it would be damaging to that child if I cannot fully support them in the way they need to, that they, and so I had to be very honest with myself about what I would be able to take, uh, what I would be able to um, give and understand of myself and support them in the way that they need to be supported. Uh, that's one example. There was a couple of examples. And, and as people know that were there, I got pretty emotional because sometimes you say you're like, I, I can't, I couldn't deal with this. It's not I couldn't because of my own issues or anything else. Um, and it has nothing to do with the child and you feel like a bad person. Mm -hmm. You feel horrible saying, 
I cannot have, I, I would not, but you're not, you're doing it for the right reasons. And I think that's, <clears throat> I'd rather have rockets shot at me than make those decisions about those beautiful children. It is so hard, to, Kelly, to, it is so hard. Just to, to explain uh, to people, in, in case you don't know Didi and, and what he's trying to do with his wife, they are trying to adopt a child. When did you start the process? When did you make the decision to adopt? Before COVID, Actually, right? before COVID, right? Yeah, so we, so we, we had woken up one morning. It was just before Christmas, like just before Christmas, uh, 2019. So it wasn't quite 2020 yet. And I looked at my wife and I said, I, I don't know what words I use. I, I, I wish I could commemorate that. But I said, I think, I, think I, want to, I think I want to adopt. And we'd been through that conversation many times over the last several years. And most of it was always, eh, no, it's probably not for us. And we'd bring it up. Eh, it's probably not for us. Uh, and then it's, you know, over the last few years for her, it's been more like, hmm, maybe we should. And I think I was like, are you still thinking we should? Because I'm thinking we should. And we both were. And so that was very exciting. And it was a huge deal for us. Uh, so that was December of 2019. We started the process uh, just after January of 2020. Um, we were on that track, on that path, and then the world shut down. And so that got waylaid. And we finished the process uh, of our home study in December. And so we're on our about fifth month now of actively seeking uh, to adopt. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any idea when to? <coughs> to oh, she process? just said it. What? My wife just said it. She said it in chat. She said, I think I want to adopt. And I and she said, hey, me too. So yeah, <laughs> we so that's right. That's true. So my wife, uh, my wife and I were both secretly oh, yeah. looking we were secretly looking at uh, yeah, these yeah, websites. Yeah, you said that before, I think. Yeah, maybe you even we didn't know. do the post. Or I, I think I heard that before. Yes, yeah. you were secretly looking and then you were talking about like, oh, you too, you too. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I, I really hope you guys <laughs> um, you guys get through this process quicker, rather quicker than than later. It's hard. Later. It's, it's um, hard. Did they tell you anything about how, the, how long that will take? Because of course they can't properly, right? Um, well, we're, we're past that right now, right now, like we're, we're here, we're actively looking like my wife is always looking at mm -hmm. the, the kids that are on the uh, adoption exchanges and we're, 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 we're putting our name in for like uh, full, full disclosure. We just uh, submitted our names a couple of days ago for, um, I think it was two, three, and five, three little ones or two, your ages, two, three, and five. Mm -hmm. We, we were not selected for those. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's tough because you, you have to steal yourself because we've, we've gone down this road of, you got to get invested a little bit or why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. But if you're yeah, invested, yeah. if you're invested, you the heartbreak is harder. Mm -hmm. They tell, you no, it's like, why? <laughs> right. Well, but I mean, <clears throat> I think it's not, a, maybe, it's not only, you know, you are looking for a kid in a one way. Maybe the kid is also looking for you, you know, maybe it's just. Well, Z Zadira wants us to adopt her. I keep telling her that. You know. <laughs> You're too old, Zadira. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but I think, I think um, I definitely agree. I think you will be great parents. Um, I, I mean, the, the, you're reflecting a lot on yourself and that's, that's a big deal. I think when you're able to f reflect on yourself and it's not about doing something wrong or right, I think it's more about the ability to reflect. And this is, this is one of the best skills you can have as a parent. So you guys will be fine. Pretty sure. We hope so. That. We, uh, you know, I, I, I shared this with you and, um, you're too old bloody as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shared this with you this weekend. Uh, I've, I've asked some, some very close friends of ours who are fathers. I, I was expressing to them uh, that, oh my God, I'm so terrified. I'm so terrified of being a dad that I'm going to screw it up, that I'm going to make a mistake, that I'm going to mm -hmm. fail at it. And I was, I was so worried and I was expressing that to them. And all of them said, you're going to fail at it because nobody knows how to be a parent. So don't think, they, they said, it's good that you're worried about it because at least that means you care, sure. but you're going to screw it up because you always screw it up. No one knows how to do it. And I think, you know, the other thing was like, you do it, you know, kid one, you're like, Hey, I screwed up so much with kid one, kid two will be perfect. Then you screw everything up with the kid two, because mm -hmm. the kid two doesn't need what kid one was, you know? So the, the good thing that it was very, it was actually very helpful to hear someone say, 
I'm, it's good that you're thinking about it, but you're, you can't think that you're not going to get it right because you're not going to get it right every time. No. And if, and if you're so hard on yourself, you're, you know, it's going to beat you up. Nobody is born to be the perfect parent. You learn to be a parent day by day. You're saying you're not the perfect parent, Izzy? No. (laughs) You sure? Come on. I'm not the perfect parent. No, definitely not. How could I? And how many times my daughter tells me that I'm doing something not the way she wants? Uh, Just that, you know? Um, (laughs) And, and, but, but that's okay. I mean, look, I think, I think the main thing is life is not perfect. And, and you, sometimes you need to be the asshole as a parent, as it is like that. And the kids don't understand it. Maybe that, that in the second you, you say no or whatever it is, but they will understand later. And this is what I learned when I got kids. I understood my mother so much better. Like, you know, wh- why the, why they are the way they are sometimes or whatever. Um, and, and. Yeah, it, it's. T- I, I totally agree with what they said. You will, you will not get it right, but that's not the point. The point is that you try, um, and and you can learn so much from kids. It's uh, it's when you're open for it, it's amazing. Yeah, and I think and I think that's that's where we are. I mean, like I said, I'm glad that somebody told me that. I'm glad that someone told me I was going <laughs> yeah, to fail. Doesn't want colored you know, cups. Okay, that's <clears> right. What'd you say? You can ruin your kid's day with a day with the cup. wrong colored cup. I understand that one. I understand that one. <laughs> that's uh, that's totally right. Damn. Or just the wrong pants, the wrong socks. You know. I mean, I'm in the age where the, the things are actually very, uh, very important. Not me. I mean, my kids are on the age three and five. So yeah, the day can be ruined by a wrong colored cup. Definitely. And they hold it against you. <laughs> oh, they hold it against you. You forgot to bring my favorite cup. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes oh uh, we're, uh, uh, we're gonna so mess this up <laughs> <laughs> especially because it's my wife but she'll tell you it's like why do we need to have a cup or should we have all these mugs she'll yeah. she'll hate that i'm talking about this we have all she wants to collect all these mugs they have mm-hmm. starbucks has like a mug for every state or mm-hmm. you know all these different mu- disney mugs and I was like, why do we need to have a mug for every place that we go to? That's we have nowhere to put these mugs. We have more mugs than we have plates. We have more, more of like, we can't even get more. But now it's like, if now a kid is going to be like, there's one mug. I get that one mug every time it mm-hmm. needs to be clean. It better be clean. And it, it better, better be not clean. break. It better not break. Cause if you break it, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. And they want the same <clears throat> mug again. You know, they will cry like for a week if you don't bring them the same mug. So better get a plastic <laughs> cup for the first years. I, oh my gosh, Bosh. <laughs> Two, 24, and 20? Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's, That's amazing, wild. Right? That's, I think that it's awesome. Right, right? It is awesome. But at least now you have like free babysitters. Call the 20 and 24 year old and be like, hey, come over here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you owe me. Um, I, I, w- I would like to go back a little bit about yeah. what you said. Um, you lost, lost friends during the service and after. Yes. Is there any is there any help from from the military itself like mental help mental help like like giving them an option like when when somebody says like i'm not in the right place i don't feel good i have anxiety attacks or whatever it is what happens because what i heard is when when you're a soldier let's say you're a marine or whatever then the process is like that you you're asking for your case manager i think and then it takes like a process of six to eight weeks till you actually get help or pills or whatever is it really like that is it that Uh, complicated yes and worse um so a couple of things to think about number one uh if you are currently serving if you're currently in a uniform uh and this this is this still i i've confirmed with i've confirmed with people still serving that this is still a problem if i go to my superiors and i'm wearing my uniform and i'm in country i'm deployed let's say i'm in afghanistan or in iraq and I'm wearing my uniform and I'm manning my post with my rifle. And I say, I'm depressed. I'm feeling bad. My head's not right. Something's wrong. They take away my rifle. Sometimes they take away my boot laces and they make me go sit in a room. Right. Uh, because you can use them for bad things. Your belt and your boot laces. People can use them to strangle themselves oh, yeah, or yeah. to do something. Boot lace, you know. so, they, okay. so they take that stuff away. And then so they've now they've now taken away 
the one thing that allowed you to do your job, your rifle, you're there to do a job, you're there to just be a soldier. They've uh, ima- uh, almost completely uh, taken the one identifiable thing that gave you any structure. And then they think, well, because we're doing that because we don't want you to kill yourself. Well, maybe that person wasn't thinking about suicide. Maybe that person just needed a little, who knows? Maybe they just needed a damn hug. I have okay, no okay, clue. Okay. Well, right? <clears throat> do they now think about suicide because they take away the waffle? Does it actually the opposite of what they try to do? So potentially what, what can happen is then you are categorized and you, you're sent to a psychologist, right? Or the, the chaplain and you're, they talk to you and make sure, hey, are you, are you thinking about suicide? And like, you're like, no, I was never thinking about suicide. Never, 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 never. I just wasn't feeling right. And you guys all overreacted and took my weapon away. Now I don't like you. Now I can't trust you. Now mm-hmm. I can't tell you. I can't tell you if I am feeling bad. The point is not that that might make somebody commit suicide. The point is- They're not open now up I, and you make it worse. Now, if I am feeling really rough, mm-hmm. I can't tell anybody because then I, then, then I get stripped of everything that makes me me, mm-hmm. right? And then if, you, if you're at home, like let's say you're not deployed and you go and you tell your, your unit and you're like, hey, I'm not feeling right. You don't have a rifle in your hands, but immediately they're like, well, I guess we got to start processing you out of the military because you're not fit for service. And, you know, we're going to get you a, you know, a mental health screening. And then we're going to give you a chapter and we're going to go ahead and remove you from the service. It's like, why do we do that? Instead of just giving somebody help, people have mental health issues. It's just a thing. Soldiers and sailors, and they, this is not a military thing. This is an everybody thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody can go through depression. Everybody has, can have anxiety. Everyone can have thoughts that are bad so why is our first reaction to call that thing broken and unusable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not we can just help them give them you know talk to them give them an opportunity to try to you know use some tools at our disposal so we have medications we have counseling we have you know other forms of therapy hell stack up itself the whole the whole reason we exist is to relieve mental health stress and anxiety by playing some video games and having some community and some commonality to not think about the bad things. You know, that's why we have a suicide prevention discord, because sometimes it's easier to get into a discord and say, Hey, I'm, you know, X 12, 420 YOLO swag, and I'm not having a great day. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with some anonymity and you can talk to somebody without judgment and without being called a broken, bad, unfixable, you know, problem. Mm -hmm. So in the military that has been, uh, a big thing. It's been a, been a thing for me. I've watched it happen in real time. I've watched it. I've heard people recently who said this is still a thing, uh, whether you're deployed or whether you're not. But the worst part about it is, is even if you're not in the uniform, you're a veteran, you're outside. Uh, there are programs at the VA to help veterans. They're garbage. And that's not saying they're not trying, but they're not. They, uh, the, veter- the VA often tries a one shoe fits all type of mentality yeah everybody go to everybody go sit around in a circle and talk about what's wrong you ever seen those you ever like seen people go to group therapy they sit around in a circle um it happens with addiction right you go to some like you go to a 12-step program or something like that and you you know hey you know my name is so and so and i'm a you know addict or alcoholic and they they talk about what's on their mind well the similar process similar a similar type of a story where you sit around and say yeah i this is what happened to me when i was deployed or this is what i dealt with that does not work for everybody I personally, it's not that I'm not interested in everybody else's stories. It's that right now, selfishly, I need to deal with what I've got going on. And I don't want to listen to how bad it everybody else has got it because that doesn't help me. I have to work through this. Now, I want to help them too, but I'm not helping them right now because I'm not feeling helpful because I need help. Uh, So the VA often uh, one size fits all saying they also say, oh, you're, you're not feeling right. Here's a pill. Two months later, we got rid of that pill. Here's another pill. Mm-hmm. Oh, we lost that contract. So here's another pill. I changed psychiatrists five times in three years at the VA. I changed medications that six was times. After, after your deployment, right? <clears throat> oh, yeah. After, right? So you, a quick, quick yeah. question before we go there. During the deployment, is there any mental support for soldiers? Like uh, uh, we, the, the joke I, right now, I couldn't, I don't know that answer today. Cause I, I, I don't currently know somebody yeah. who is, de- who is deployed and that I'm close to. Uh, but I know for us, it was, if you weren't feeling right, your first step was to go talk to a chaplain. And the funny part is, is that not everybody's religious. 
Yeah. And not every chaplain, a, a chaplain in the army is supposed to observe every, they don't, they, they like, let's say they're a Christian. Let's say they're a Catholic chaplain. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be sensitive uh, to all faiths regardless. Uh, but I still don't see the real, I mean, chaplains are wonderful people. I've met lots of great chaplains out there, but I don't understand why your first step needs to be go to talk to a chaplain. It's, I mean, it's nice because they're usually very, they like to listen. They're, they're, they're there to be accommodating. Um, but I mean, but they're they, not professionals. It's about listening, they're, but it's they're not mental health professionals. But it's interesting here. Yeah, Jim, Berlin, Jim said the same and he served in, um, <coughs> God damn it. Um, Kosovo. Is that even English? I said only. Oh English. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. and then he said he said the same thing. So um they only had to talk to a chaplain. And and at Bosnia. Oh sorry, sorry, Jim. Um so so isn't that weird? The, the that, Balkans, right? Yeah. Isn't it weird that today, I mean, like like word travels so fast, right? Um, but stuff like that. And and I would I would think like at least people would understand what what survivor guilt is you know what anxiety attacks and what post traumatic stress is yeah but but they they can't offer like professional help um, isn't that like a little bit like I don't know wouldn't we expect more today well we like you remember you said uh, so this weekend you you said we're we're kind of like in baby shoes now mm -hmm. so and the so we've come a long way PTSD mental health issues for veterans for soldiers for people that have deployed for people that have been in combat is not new we only talk about it like it's new because we kind of just figured out it's a thing and i mean like the last 10 15 20 years we were yeah. like oh well this is a thing and even then we still weren't doing it right but these folks that were in world war one world war two korean war vietnam panama you know all of this um Fal the falkland falcon wars if you're you know uk or french or, uh, all of that these people who have been to war in previous eras same problems zero solutions in fact once upon a time how many times have you heard somebody tell you oh you're depressed why don't you just stop and just be happy like why just stop being depressed i mean mm -hmm. stop thinking about stop thinking bad just thoughts think positive. just stop <laughs> right like it'll or, or it'll get better it'll be it'll get better it'll mm -hmm. get better and i know that we should say it gets better but it's like right but right now it's not better so that's not helpful mm -hmm. like you, you can say some very what you think are supportive things that are not very supportive they're dismissive they're very dismissive uh mizzy if i tell you i if you're what do you mean you're stressed out why don't you just relax mm -hmm. how does that help you <laughs> how does that help you I, I told you to relax but that you're not gonna relax you're stressed mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. you know that's, that's not and helpful. the thing is the, the thing is also that if you have like anxiety attacks and stuff like that it's not only mentally it's also phys physically right like uh like yeah like you feel pain in your chest you know people some people even with PS, P, ptsd they throw up you know oh you you remember this um uh, ex-marine guy dakota meyer do you know his name dakota meyer i know da mm -mm. um and he he's a he he's one he's a famous marine you know um but it doesn't matter the point is that he said i heard him in an interview saying like he had uh, anxiety attacks and he reached out, you know, um, to the military. He said, like, guys, I have a problem. I need to talk to someone. And then he said, like, how the process worked and they didn't help him. Like, it takes over six weeks, you know, stuff like that. Um, and in the end, what helped him was um, he, he did additional therapies. And one of that was, um, oh, how do you pronounce it right? I think it's it's a psychedelic drug, actually. He took, like, a psilocybin. Psy Psychosilibin. Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah, LSD. It's acid. Is it LSD? Yep, acid. Oh, okay. <clears throat> have you heard of that? Does, does it actually help? Have you there's ever? current studies happening on it. I mean, yeah, it, so current, but they're not funded. That's also very interesting. Well, what, yeah, one of the yeah mushrooms. Oh, sorry, okay. psilocybin mushrooms. is the mushrooms. Yeah, it's yeah mushrooms. Uh, the other one is the oh the name for LSD. But yeah, it's the uh, there's current studies on both of those actually uh, mm -hmm. to form creative and reactive behavior changes uh and so there's there's some really interesting stuff that's happened that it's definitely that's right there we go thank you mason exactly exactly yeah and uh, yeah it's definitely interesting especially because you can't get addicted to it as, as at least that's what i heard of um um and i think this is really great if, if this is something that that helps people you know to get rid of anxiety attacks and stuff like that and it's it's um it's not like you know it's something long term something 
then it's actually great. I hope they do more studies on that and actually get it through. Um, yeah. So well, and like uh, same thing there too with uh, uh, cannabis, marijuana, and uh, depression and anxiety, uh, as well as uh, trauma support and well and pain relief. Right. One thing that the VA, the veterans that veterans do get pretty easily is Vicodin. Yes. Um, so if I go in for headaches and I have super bad headaches because of whatever is wrong with my head, uh, I can pretty easily get a you know narcotic prescribed to me. Mm -hmm. Well, nar nar those narcotics, uh, like anything that's heroin based, right? Or poppy based is addictive. highly addictive. Exactly. Highly addictive. That's why we stopped giving soldiers morphine in combat mm -hmm. because they started using it when they didn't need it, yeah, you of know? Yeah. So instead of that, you know, something that's not addictive at all, you know, like cannabis or something else, if you can find, you know, strains that have properties for maybe relieving stress, maybe relieving headaches, maybe, you know, uh, you know, working on uh, depression, mm -hmm. uh, muscle relaxation, uh, anti, anti-inflammatory. So hopefully we can look at some of these things and not be so like, Oh, that's so bad. And more like, well, yeah, anything's bad. If you just constantly do it, you know, drinking is horrible, but everybody can get, go get beer right now. I mean, I can't, some of my worst nights have been because I've had too much alcohol, not because I was out having fun with friends. It's because I was mad, depressed, upset, and I drank too much. Mm -hmm. That is a big problem for anybody who's ever done that. And for someone that does it consistently, it's a warning sign. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's other ways to, to help people. And we just need to look at all options. Tell me some other ways. Mm -hmm. I want to hear other ways. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about, uh, and we don't have to talk about medication, right? We can talk about therapy. Yes. What do people, you know, when you, when you hear the word therapy, what do you think of? Going to a shrink. Yep. First thing I don't know on my mind. Now, now, you know what? That's okay. I go see a shrink. I know a lot of people that go see, you know, trauma counselors. Mine's a trauma counselor. I don't really call him a shrink, um, but whatever. He's a shrink. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, <coughs> pardon, <clears throat> that person that I get to go to helps me think through problems, is not judgmental. And in my case, it works out very well, very helpful, listens, um, offers only things that he thinks are very important to the conversation for me to consider. Uh, and that can be very helpful. That doesn't work for everybody. What can work for some people is going to church. I don't care if you're religious or not, but for some people, their faith is very important to them. Yeah. And for some people, the people that they go, I have, I'm not a very religious person, but I've gone to church and walked out of a church feeling, man, I feel very, I feel like, because if you go see somebody motivational speak, it doesn't matter what they're motivational speaking about. You're like, oh, wow, I feel like I can go and do that thing too. There's like a good feeling you can get from that. And it's for some people, their faith, they can, uh, they can be very comforted by the beliefs that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, it's their family and they go and they can hang out with their family and know that that, um, that very organic love of a family can be that thing that kind of gets them by. For other people, it's sports. Go out, play a game, go shoot some hoops, Doing go music. kick a soccer ball, go, go sing music, go to a concert, go to medication, go to the gym and pump iron and get all those, you know, because all of these things we're talking about, all of these activities make all of these awesome chemicals fire and do the things they're supposed to do up in the brain, mm -hmm. all your serotonin, all the happy stuff, all the happy triggers. So if it's not working for you, just try something else. But so when we at stack up, when we use video games and comic books and movies and geeky nerdy stuff, how different is that from going to the gym or something else? If I can do that and give you that serotonin spike, if I can give you that feel good, if I can give you that safe place, even just to feel like you're part of a community and play some games, not judge, enjoy yourself, man, it's, it's just one more tool in your tool belt. Yeah. So one talking more tool in your tool belt. Talking about stack up, um, explain us what is stack up. <coughs> explain me in your own words quick, maybe what is stack up? What are you guys doing there? How do you help people? Uh, so stack up is a military oriented charity. So we're a, we're a legitimate 501 C three, um, you know, tax nonprofit. We support veterans specifically. Our, our programs are veteran specific, uh, to support mental health and suicide prevention. And we use gaming and all the things that are geek culture to, to, to achieve that goal. Um, we are also offer suicide prevention services through the form of, uh, crisis intervention, on discord through our stop program we have a stack up overwatch program and that's for anybody veteran or not can hop in there yeah. uh, but what what we do is we look for folks from u.s or allied forces we're not just a u.s charity 
we are a charity based in the U.S., mm-hmm. right? Uh, but we, you know, you know, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, New Zealand, Germany, France, Italy. I mean, any of the people I tell people if the, they got shot at by the same bad guys that I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they probably have some of the same concerns or issues or after effects of war or combat service mm-hmm. as I do. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, the United States, we lose uh, about 22 veterans a day to suicide. That is our 22 statistical rate. a day? Yes. Um, how and much it's probably is that in percentage hmm? a year. Like how uh, we could do math. There's 330 million Americans, but we lose 22, 22 veterans a day on average. That's before 2020. We are pretty certain that when the numbers come back for 2020, we will see an elevated rate of that across the entire demographic of every country of it because like, suicides probably went up. Further isolation. Mm-hmm. more isolation of, they can't reach more out isolation mm-hmm. can't reach out um they can no longer do the fun things that they used to do for their therapy or for their mm-hmm. so we we just know that unfortunately we're probably going to see higher numbers but on average so 22 a day in the united states that's just in the united states though uh we have more veterans than other countries that's just a numbers thing we just have more veterans we had more people in countries deployed mm-hmm. um but that's also because we have a larger population and a larger military force than other countries. If you template that over the rest of, you know, let's say, you know, UK military or Irish military or, you know, Canadian military, Australian military, I guarantee you they do not have no health, mental health problems. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not magically a US thing. It's, this is a thing that veterans no, all it's have a general in common. Thing. Definitely. Yeah. So we look at that and say, we need to support our veterans in any possible way. And this is how we choose to do it. We choose to throw a video game in front of you. We choose to open up our doors and say, hey, come play a game with us if you don't have anybody to play a game with. We send you a comic book. We say, we take veterans and we send them to uh, big major events. When COVID doesn't exist, we take them to E3 and TwitchCon and PAX. And hopefully maybe this year or next year, we'll get to go to Gamescom in Germany. We'll, we'll get to do things like that. Um, and as we take veterans to that, those things, we give them a, a safe space, a place to go enjoy themselves, to maybe get something that they would not have done by themselves because of social anxiety. Uh, maybe it's just maybe it's just one good thing that's happened to them this year. Maybe that's all it is. But if we can do those things and we can make the worst thing in your mind the last thing in your mind, then maybe the worst thing in your mind doesn't get a chance to consume you. And that's that's what we're here to do. That's what we're all about. So I was thinking, um, mm-hmm. like, so Stack Up is all about <clears throat> creating events, as I understand, right? Creating events for veterans to give them a sense of joy and you are not alone. Is that right? Certainly you are not alone for sure. Um, and the creating events, I guess you can describe as, uh, we'll, we will send, we'll send a care package, a supply crate full of uh, like at Xbox and mm-hmm. games to mm-hmm. uh, troops that are deployed to, you know, Northern Africa, right? Mm-hmm. We have troops deployed in Northern Africa doing, you know, peacekeeping or whatever they're doing, but it still sucks. They're away from their family. They're sometimes a little bit dangerous, a little exposed, or even if mm-hmm. they're in combat zone, like parts of Afghanistan or Iraq. And for that few moments, that one team gets to sit around and play a little game, play some Call of Duty, play some Mario Kart. And that's the one thing they're not thinking about is getting shot at. Or maybe the one thing they're not thinking about is how far from home they are, because mm-hmm. it does. You don't have to get shot at to feel like this. Yeah, you no, just have I to mean, have all that. Just that separation. to think about that there is something that could happen to you is enough. The, right. You know. Right. And it's if it's in your mind and stuck in your mind, it's terrible. Absolutely. Um. um if people want to uh, here, because we have gamers, you know, we have streamers watching watching this episode. I I want to. I want to I want to say it quick so people know. Yeah. Um, stack up stack up does charity events as well, like working with yep. streamers, you know, to get the word out. Um, Absolutely. How how can people reach out to you? What what do they have to do? Um, because most of the time, I think we talked about that like before, like half a year ago, um, and you said like December. most people, yeah, most people think like they have to to do this or that, or it has to be you know big and crazy, and they have to get a lot of money, but everything uh, every small thing helps actually right You're, yeah um <clears throat> people people like perky daisy in chat here again she's my my counterpart uh there at sack up 
people tell us all the time, like, oh, you know, I only stream, you know, two days a week and I only have, you know, a handful of you. I have a small community or, um, oh, I don't, I don't think that I'll be able to raise a lot of money. We, that's not important to us. What's important to us is people know about what we do and, and, and talk about how to get to the services that we provide. One of the things that we don't see enough of is uh, other allied countries, veterans requesting our services, requesting a supply crate, you know, doing things like that. And so we'd love to be able to show people, look, you're right. 99% of the supply crates we send out are doing to, or to American veterans. It's not for lack of trying. We need people to request those crates. We need people to come to us and say, hey, my, my brother was in the Italian army. He served in Afghanistan for a short period of time. And I'd like to get him one of these crates because I think it would benefit, you know, he doesn't, he's, you know, he, he's kind of a little distant or whatever else. And so they, they ask us to supply that. We're going to look at that and we're going to say, well, yeah, we want to get that out there. We want people to know that we, we do support all of our allies. Veterans are veterans. If you never shot at me, we're friends. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as long as, you know, that's the way we you kind of look at that. But um, if you want to get involved with that, you can always reach out to me. I'm very open. You guys can see me on Twitter. I'm, t I'm, I'm rarely on Twitch now, hopefully again soon. Perky Daisy's in chat here. You can DM her. You can yeah, send her I a just, DM. By the way, I just posted her Twitter link here, guys. Uh, yeah. In case you're interested, um, just look her up on Twitter <clears throat> if you want to send her a DM or anything. You know, link is in the chat. Um, that's Absolutely. amazing. I'm sorry I cut you there. No, you're fine. Uh, but but she or I will give you guys everything mm -hmm. you need. We will support you guys. We will get uh, anybody who wants to stream for us for charity. We'll get you all of the assets, all of the branding. We want to make it as easy on people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, we know that if you're going to stream for anything, even for this, like Mizzy, how much work did you put into like getting everything right? It's a, it's a production. You want the value to be right. You want it to be good. If I can give you things that take time off of your hands to, to let you put together a better product, you have to do less work. And so we want to be able to provide you with that. We want to give That's you amazing. more of that. Yeah, by the way, guys, um, <clears throat> this is what we talked about because Gamers Who Care will do another charity event this year. We didn't set a date yet, but we we probably will do it th something about June uh, or July. And this event will definitely be together with Stack Up here. Uh, I'm so looking forward to that. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, also, in case, yeah, you guys, in case you guys say like you want to support us, uh, Gamers Who Care in part of organization um, or whatever it is, you know, we have so many things to do in the background. Just hit me up or join our Discord. Um, um, hit us up, you know, we are, we are always happy to get more help to organize these events because it really takes a lot of time. Um, normally, well, actually, normally I, it takes like the last events took me like three months to prepare so we have now april may you yeah it's probably more like july or august we will do the next event but we are definitely we will definitely start prepping the next one soon so in case you guys want to join us for whatever reason to organize this we always we are always happy to have more help um is cylon from italy yeah, Cylon is from Italy. Exactly. I think I think they're very they're very happy that I chose the Italian military as like an example. I was just look I was I wasn't trying to be, you know, <laughs> but that worked out. That's pretty nice. I'm glad. I'm glad I said something. So yeah, if you know somebody from the Italian military that wants a, that needs a supply crate that you think would that would benefit from that, go to our website. Go to the stackup that go to the stackup that our website. You can literally look at where to request, you know, supply crates from and how to do that. It's right there on the site. <laughs> more dad i mean deity streams i i'm hoping to come back to streaming yeah that's a good question that's after good. may um I, I actually let's switch to the gaming part oh, man, oh we always yeah. talk like one uh, two hours almost oh god so okay i want to say real quick thank yes, you everybody please. that's still here and yes. hanging out and listening to my dumb voice for this long i i i love that it's been great to talk with mizzy um even this weekend and then today about what we're talking about but thank you guys all so much for hanging out and listening to any of this bs that i'm spouting and it's all the everything that i'm saying doesn't represent anyone doesn't represent stack up doesn't represent all veterans this is just sean me saying these things to you guys and so i appreciate that if it's made any impact so far whatsoever if it's resonated at all um, thank you. And, uh, you know, for, for even paying any attention to that. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, 
uh, one one last thing. Um, I, I could talk to you for hours about the military stuff, to be honest. Um, yeah. Um, but one last thing. If um, and I had actually a few more questions, but we can make it in time. I mean, we can make people sit here like for four hours. Maybe so we have to do a round two. I think we have to do one two for sure. <laughs> Next time we talk about battlefield. Um, no. Um, so one last question: If somebody is transitioning back home, I think this is this is a major part of being a soldier coming home, and this transitioning back is very hard for most of them. Um, yes. And tell me, and, and I don't want to tell too many things up front. Please give me a heads up. Like how. How was it for you when you came back? What did you get confronted with when you came back? Um, especially the family situation and friends. You know, it's interesting. That, so when I first came back from Iraq, um, very different reception. Let me pause here. The day I got back from Iraq to the States, um, I, well, the, the week I went, I went to Georgia, I, I, came back from Iraq. I took some time off. I didn't go back to, to Hawaii. I went and took some time off. Went to go see my dad in Georgia, spent a little time there. And I went to go to Chicago to see my family in Chicago. Um, we had my grandfather's birthday was coming up. And the day I got to Chicago, I'd been out of Iraq. I'd been out of Kuwait and Iraq for about 10 days. I got back to Chicago, saw my grandfather and he had had cancer and no one told me how bad and how, how progressed his cancer was when I was in Iraq. They didn't want me to, they didn't want me to worry about mm -hmm. my grandpa. Um, I had walked in the door and I saw my grandpa and he was you know, a very tiny man at this point. He had an oxygen tank. He was so tiny. And I got to spend about three or four hours with him and he passed away while I was there. So the, the day the I The day returned, you came back? Yeah. Well, the day I got to Chicago, I mean, I, I'd been in, I was in Georgia for about eight, nine days before then, but oh, okay. yeah, he passed away the day I showed up. I literally got to the door you know, I flew to flew flew in the morning, got to Chicago, uh, showed up at the door at like nine or 10 a.m. And about one, one thirty or two o'clock in the afternoon, he had passed away. Um, yeah. So that was a huge, huge thing for me for a lot of reasons. Like the, you know, the comment was from some of my family is like, oh, he waited for you to get home, which is always, it's very kind of people to say. And it's, I don't, I don't believe in some of the, the more um, cosmically, you know, I, you know, I, you know, we talked to you about, was it kiss, kismet that we talked yeah, about? We were we kind of joking, what is, what, mm -hmm. like, what does that mean? And uh, what is all that? And so, but it was very powerful because I did get to see the man and I got to share some time with him and sit next to him. And then he passed away. Um, so my, my, my coming home was interrupted. My feeling, my, my, the way that I was able to process combat and Iraq and all of that was paused mm -hmm. because now I had to deal with something else. And oh, by the way, it was my grandmother, myself, um, a couple of smaller cousins, and little, little smaller cousins. I had to do. I had to take charge. I had to do everything. I had to, you know, get her, get my grandma to call nine one one. I had to. I stayed there with my grandfather, you know, because it all kind of happened like that. I had the younger, so the younger uh, cousins take the littlest cousins. Hey, go upstairs. Just have to stay up there. Nobody comes in the side of the house. It's going to get really chaotic. Everything's going to be okay. And so I flipped my switch. Instead of being sad and, and devastated in the moment, I had to take care of something. I had to take care of something that my grandmother was certainly not going to be able to do that the little kids were not able to understand. Mm -hmm. And I had to just do that. So I had come back from a place where I was full on adrenaline and just constantly going, 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 going. I came home for some rest and relaxation and then had to stop mm -hmm. and pause. And so I had to go through all of that. And then a few you know, months go by, a few weeks go by, I go back to Hawaii, I go back to work. And I went right back to work and I'm at, I'm at it again. And so the one thing that I, I regret, it's not a regret. The one thing that I think I uh, have to acknowledge is I never got to decompress after coming out of Iraq. I didn't have time. I came back to, I came back from Iraq and there was another problem that was, that was worse than what I, you know, my, my grandfather, his sickness and, and him being ailed and then him passing away, uh, took away. And that, this is not like complaining that my, oh, God damn it, Grandpa! You died. Now I can't deal with my bullshit. Oh, geez, Grandpa. No, it's it's. I just didn't get a chance to. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I had to do something else, and it, it does have an impact. So the uh, the process of coming back then 
was I just let I just let everyone I walk into rooms and people are like yay because I'm the first person that they've known in 20 years to be in combat and they're like yay and my 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 unit and my friends are like oh we can't we're glad to have you back fanfare lots of fanfare um, and it was all kind of empty because my grandpa just passed away so I didn't get to enjoy any of that I didn't get to experience any of that and I'm not sure I wanted to um, fast forward a few years and and go into Afghanistan a completely different story Afghanistan just felt different. And I, I, I didn't decompress from Afghanistan in, in different ways. There were some things that I saw in Afghanistan that were, man, I saw a lot of stuff in Iraq. I didn't see anything like that, what I saw in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, I saw some of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, whether it was just combat situations or, you know, death or the loss of U.S. forces or uh, any of that, it was uh, just bad decision making, bureaucracy invading into a small space of uh, military occupation, military operations. And so I was very frustrated. I found myself very frustrated, very angry in Afghanistan. When I got back, the first thing I thought was, God, I'm so fucking glad I'm out of there. And I didn't die on accident because, you know, just bad decision making can lead to that stuff. <coughs> Sorry for the coughing. <coughs> little, uh, Sorry. little, uh, <clears throat> a little phlegmy there sorry um, but yeah it's so, so coming back from Afghanistan I was a little more numb I was a little more there was fanfare people wanted fanfare people wanted to talk about us coming back because that's just what you do for soldiers now we don't treat we didn't treat soldiers well after Vietnam we do treat them better now when they come home but it was all very empty um, and it, it, it's taken me years to really feel some of the things from Iraq and Afghanistan independently um, because I don't know how I feel about them. I, it's hard because I'm very proud of my service. I'm very proud of my service. I'm very proud of what I, what I believed in and what I was doing. And I, and I don't think I ever betrayed that, but I think that there's larger worldview things, larger things that, that took place that I'm not sure I'm proud of. That I was that I was anywhere near. That you were a part of, right? Yeah, um, there's definitely a lot of decisions that I saw made that were out of my hands. Exactly, that, it's not in your control, right? Yeah, right. And there's some things like that 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 you know, some people have PTSD where, uh, let's say you go you get into a car crash, right? And it's it's traumatic, and someone's injured very badly, and you 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 have a lot of pain for a lot of hours. You go to the emergency room, but let's say you survive, but you have this PTSD. This traumatic event took place about that car crash. Maybe, maybe the next time you almost get into a car crash, you have a panic attack because of how much that affects you. Some of my PTSD isn't necessarily from trauma that hit me. Some of it is from things that I witnessed. And some of it is from things that other people did and decisions that they made that affected things. Um, so PTSD is not just this, uh, oh, I got shot here in combat and that shot healed but it could have killed me but now every time i hear a gunfire i'm you know that's that's all true these things can happen to people mine is a little bit different i do every time the door shuts i freak out because it sounds like a rocket impact it feels like that the overpressure that's the sound and so i oh, do get maybe a little you should down. think about getting kids <laughs> <laughs> oh they're gonna slam all the doors and everything yes. so but uh, thank you, Bosh. I do appreciate that, man. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, people do need all that support. And, you know, Pat, Pat members is right there. But uh, I don't know how I feel about a lot of that stuff. And so I don't a lot. There's a lot of things I still keep hidden. Uh, you know, I say we talk about feeling out loud. Some of this stuff, I don't feel very out loud. It's it's too it's mine. You know, you ever you ever feel like I don't want to tell you the problem and I don't want you to solve it for me because it's actually mine and I own it. And at least there's one thing that I own. And that's this, this darkness, this thing about this, I'm fine. It's not going to hurt me, but I own this and I can't share this with you for either, either because I don't want to share this because it's mine. I kind of covet the hard stuff that I've had to deal with. And number two is if I give it to you, now you have to deal with it too. And that's not fair. You know, I don't want you to have to struggle with that. I'm, I'm going to keep this from you because if I tell you what this, how, how bad this feels and what this looks like, then maybe you're going to feel that too. And that's not fair. Yeah. I think for me, it's most of the time more like that. I know the answer and I can't have anyone tell me again, the answer I already know. So it doesn't help me. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, like, it's, yeah. um, it's yeah. like, especially with me and game is to care. Like, I get so many times, you know, I, I get also DMs like, you know, Missy, if you want to talk, you know, just talk to me. And I feel like, 
I can't. It's it's my problem. Like you said, I don't want to shove it on you. You know, you have your own problems. And the second thing is like, I know the solution, but I, I, I just don't know, you know, it doesn't help. You know what I think it is? It, you know what I think does help? Mm -hmm. The fact the fact that they said that, it doesn't matter if you take them up on that. That's so true. If I, if I, you know that if somebody's I tell you, there. Mm -hmm. Yep. If I tell you, hey, Mizzy, you know, you know what? I know, I know that you're going through something. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here. I'm just letting you know that I'm here. Maybe I'm not the person. And I'm not even saying I want to be the person, but I'm offering that. Maybe I'm not the person. Maybe 10 people say, hey, Mizzy, let me know if you ever need to talk about this. I'm here. Maybe you never talk to any one of those people about it, but mm -hmm. just knowing that someone is saying, I'm here, I'll just mm -hmm. listen. Yeah, that's true. I'll I, yeah, that is an, it's a very nice comfort. Now, certainly there's times where it's like, you know, Hey, I'm here. And I don't know why you're not talking to me. I know that you've been going through this for six months. I told you that I'm here. I'm right here. Let's get over this. Let's get over this together. It's like, man, now you're kind of broaching into a, I, now you're being too pushy. Now you're like really mm -hmm. making me want to. Yeah. So I think that it does help to tell somebody if we all, we don't have to like, and oh, by the way, if you don't want to hear this from someone, here's me telling you right now, if you're not capable of listening, don't tell someone that you're capable of listening. Mm -hmm. That's a good if, advice. If, if you are not capable of listening to someone else's darkest trauma, when you say, I don't know what you got going on, but if you ever need to talk to somebody, I'm here. That sounds great. And we love you for wanting to be helpful. But if you're not ready to hear what you might hear, you might be doing more damage. It is okay to say, I'm here for you. I probably can't help your problem, but uh, maybe I can find somebody else who can. That's, that's one way. But if you're not ready to hear somebody's stuff, mm -hmm. it's okay. It's okay to say like, I'm so sorry you're going through that. I wish I could help. It's okay to say that too. But if you tell somebody that I'm always here to listen, you better damn be well ready to listen. Because what, what if somebody takes you up on that? Mm -hmm. You don't want, you don't want to have that responsibility and fuck it up. <laughs> don't, you know? So, but it's not hard though. That's the thing is like, people make it harder than it is. It's not hard to just sell, tell somebody if, if they want to talk, you can listen. Oh, for some people it's hard just to listen. Oh yeah, for sure. <clears throat> And that's okay as well. Not everyone can do it, like you said. What 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 would you, if you would, um, what would you recommend somebody who is transitioning, um, and has come back probably with a trauma? You know, what would you recommend them to do? How to transition in a way so they're not get lost in their feelings and feel alone? Um, yeah, is there anything you can recommend them? That's difficult, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to say a couple of things here. Number one, um, just like any other form of, just like any addiction, admitting that you have a problem is a really important part of that, right? Admitting to yourself that you're, that you're struggling with anything is important. If you can't admit to yourself that you're struggling with it, you can't find any help for it. And no help that someone offers you is going to be taken or used in the right way because you're going to be off. You're going to be put off. You're going to, uh, what, like uh, Zadira says, let me bully you with my support. You're going to see everything as an invasion of your privacy. The first thing that anybody has to do if they've experienced something like that is at least say, I'm carrying baggage. I've got something that's on my head. I've got mm -hmm. something that's on my heart. Once you've got that and you know, like, look, I don't know, I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. What you don't do is throw yourself directly at the easiest option for all of that, which is solitude. And that's okay to be alone. It is mm -hmm. okay to take some time, but throwing yourself at solitude, not the best option. Throwing yourself at alcohol, not the best option. It's so easy and it does solve a problem for 30 minutes. And then after an hour, it doesn't solve that problem anymore. You might've forgotten about it, but it's caused another one, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're going down poor paths. And once you've, once you're inebriated and once you're, once you're through those things, now it's like the things that you might be able to combat with a sober mind, you can't combat now with a drunken mind. Mm -hmm. That's the problem there. And so then you try to get more drunk. So you don't dangerous. seek, oh, it's so dangerous, mm -hmm. but you don't seek solitude just for the sake of solitude, uh, just to be alone. You don't seek, you know, alcohol just for that, but that doesn't mean that you have to, that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy some time privately. It doesn't mean that you can't. You know, hell, you ever had, you ever been through something and somebody says like, you're like, man, I just want to cry. I just want to cry. Mm -hmm. So cry, just do it. Just let like it go. no one, 
No one has to see it. No one has to know it. You're not weak for doing it. If that's what you need to get out, if that's what needs to happen for your heart and your head to be okay to just sit in the shower and cry, do what you got to do. You know, we're, <laughs> even God can't see it there, right? You just go ahead. Just, just do that thing. Express yourself. Allow yourself to feel out loud to a certain point just to say, I'm not perfect. I'm not feeling great, but I, I'm not going to hide behind all of the worst things that I've got in front of me. I'm going to look for ways okay. to. Okay, quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> you go to the military, you have your mm -hmm. basic training, and what you learn yes. is cut your shit together, hold it in, don't fucking cry, and do, yeah. the, do the thing you do. And then you get out of the military, you know, you tell, tell them, if you cry, cry. And it's right, it's good. But, mm -hmm. but you know, this is, this is the most difficult thing. You know, be vulnerable. Um, yeah. Letting go. Um, it, let like, it go. You know, and I know it's good. Let it go. But how how do you if there should there be like a program, a transitional program for people to to get out? So. Um, oh, I love that. I love that. Yes, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. There should be because um, you're right. You know, you, we when we think of a soldier, when we think of a soldier, we think of a steeled hardened, uh, quick thinking, very, very uh, um, regimented, strict structure, up, down, left, right, up, down, left, right. We think of all of these things. They have to happen this way. There is no deviation. You can't be an individual. You can't have individual thought. You have to be group think. You have to think through the mission. You have to go for the goal. And that is how we get it done. Hey, we're done. Yay. And then it's like, okay, but that didn't allow me any time to decompress or understand what I just did or think about the feelings that it really, Oh my God, I've done so much stuff now. And I haven't once considered what it was going to do to me. We do that to people. Mm -hmm. That is why, that is why being a, a service member, a member of the military is a little bit different. I won't say it's harder than being a paramedic or a firefighter or, for, or, a, or a policeman or any of those. It's not that it's harder. It is different because you are expected to have You're expected with the, expected to live within those boundaries 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. There's very little room to have individuality, very little room. And they do it on purpose. And it, it makes sense. I understand it. But that's what we sign on to do. And so when we're done, we really need to have a way to say, look, you're no longer wearing boots anymore. You're no longer wearing a uniform. The rank that you wore is not the rank you have in civilian world. You can feel, you can be upset. You can be angry. You can disagree. You couldn't do that before, but you can do it now. Here's some really good tools to use. That would be amazing mm -hmm. if our processes out of the military were to break up that mixed messaging and say, hey, listen, we needed you to be that hardcore soldier when you were in the uniform, but right now we just need you to be a regular old human to go back and function in society. Mm -hmm. Best way we can get to do that is to teach you how to be an unrobotic thinker and to just let yourself feel again. Um, because it's hard. It is hard. And it is a dichotomy. It's, 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 you know, we want people to be, you can't, you have to, you're in combat. People are shooting at you. People trust you. You, you have soldiers that belong to you. You can't break down. Yeah, of course not. You can't you're cry. Not, you have to be yeah. focused and strong. Of course. Remember earlier when I said flipping a switch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not the only one. Uh, we learn how to flip a switch so that I'm telling you right now. How do you learn that, by the way? If you say, like, you learn how to, do, is there a specific thing how to learn to flip a switch? I, I think that, that thing. <laughs> I think we all do. And I think I learned it in basic training. I think that, like, I like that's the day that I decided to flip the switch because that's the first time I ever had to employ that tactic. But not consciously. Um, I think it was a conscious decision to do what I was doing. I don't think I understood it. It took a little while. But then I realized, okay, I see what I did. I, I, I know I did it. It was a conscious decision, but I don't know why. Now, and my wife will tell you that I flip a switch. I think worms are gross. This is a segue. You're going to say like, why are you talking about worms? I think worms are disgusting. They wiggle. They're these weird feeling things. They're wet and slimy and they're covered in dirt and mud. Lots and I think they're protein. gross. <laughs> <laughs> but everything about worms is disgusting to me. Mm -hmm. I, I love to go fishing. It's super calm, it's super, you know, especially in some of the places that we have here, the rivers, the woods and all of it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's very serene. So what do I do? I flip a switch. 
I rip that worm in half. I bait that hook. I don't even think about how gross or anything it is. I just get that done. And it's sitting there squirming through me. It's a live thing squirming on the hook there. Sorry for people that love worms and I'm, I'm, I'm using them as bait, but I just flip my switch. I get it done. Whatever else, throw it in the water and hope a fish eats it. Yes, Mrs. Didi. That, that's how we do it. <laughs> so the whole point of that that's a it's really good thanks babe um the the one thing that uh, i think is important with that story about the 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 worm is in order to do the thing that you're trying to accomplish you're going to have to go through some hard stuff some of that stuff is not stuff you're used to or can enjoy or there's no there's nothing enjoyable about it i can promise you that uh being shot at in combat whether it's bullets missiles or rockets is not interesting, exciting, or fun. Anybody that tells you those things might have some other things they need to work on. It is scary. I I had friendly fire. I had a, a, somebody had a a, a L249 saw, which is a submachine gun that fires 5.56 ammunition, very fast. And they put it on the back of a vehicle in Afghanistan. And it was still had chambered rounds. It was a belt fed weapon and it went off. I've never told this story to anybody, by the way. And it went off and I'm walking to a a mess hall tent. I have three or four soldiers with me. It's bright, broad daylight. These guys just came back from a helicopter mission. They put the saw on the back. It's called a saw, a squad assault weapon. They put it on the back of a vehicle and it triggered. And about 16 rounds came out. And they all went flying right past all of us. We heard them, the whizzing, the kicking up of the dust, the ricochet off of a piece of concrete. And we didn't know it sounded almost like firecrackers. And because of bzz, 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 bzz. in that moment, I can promise you there were zero fun things. Once the once it kicked in, that like, oh my God, the, those are bullets that just came through six people and missed all of us. Because they literally missed us. Mm-hmm. None of us were hit. Mm-hmm. We every every single person out there, four, four other soldiers or three other soldiers, we all could have been hit and died. Any one of us. And we would have been done Mm -hmm. that realization. No one will ever be able to tell me that that's a fun and great and exciting thing to be a part of. No, Mm -hmm. it is hard. So in that moment, once we realized what we did, everybody flipped their switch, took cover, figure out what's going on. Is everybody okay? Who's hit? Anybody hit? Am I okay? Mm -hmm. Think about it for a minute. You might not feel like you're hit yet. Maybe it hits you and it, because sometimes it feels like a little bit of a sting. Yeah. Yeah. And your adrenaline's Mm -hmm. kicking. Is anybody okay? So that's a small little thing. It wasn't even the enemy that did it. It was our own bullets and it was just an accident, right? Or Mm -hmm. something that just tragically happened, but that could have ended someone right in front of us. Mm -hmm. So that aside, in that moment, the excitement, the adrenaline and all that stuff, it's not exciting like fun. It's it's all of your senses are heightened Mm -hmm. and some of the stuff is deadened Mm -hmm. and it's like, focus. And for me, my first thing as a leader, as a, as a staff sergeant at the time, I'm like, you okay. You okay. Hey, go into that, uh, the, go into that tent right there. Make sure every single person in there is, is fully accounted for mm-hmm. go in there right now. Go, go, go. I don't care. It's the female's tent. Just scream. Say, is anybody okay? Like tell them what's going on and have full accountability. And we did, we started that process of going through, you know, mm-hmm. screw, we were going to lunch, screw lunch. Lunch isn't important right now. We got to make sure that it's not a single person that we didn't see that's down and bleeding. Mm-hmm. So that's the, you know, you flip the switch and you do this all the time. Soldiers in combat, they're getting shot at. They're trying to acquire a target. They're trying to return fire. Can they be freaked out fully and be effective? No, we require them to turn it off. You're no longer a regular old human. You have to be able to kind of be a robot and sense through it and get through it. It's what we train for. And then when you're all done, it's not like it didn't happen. Some people say it's like it happened to somebody else. Mm-hmm. I can I can attest to the fact of sometimes it's it's like it happened to somebody else. Mm-hmm. But when you realize it happened to you, now it's your bullshit to deal with mm-hmm. and cope with. Yeah, so you said and then slap the dickhead that was responsible senseless. <laughs> yeah. And and uh yeah. And and it was it was a, it was a, you know, trust me, that that guy I don't think is serving any longer, but it also it messed him up really bad. We By the way, he Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. It messed them up really bad. Go ahead. Oh yeah, because they when they they found the guy that was responsible for for, for that weapon that mm-hmm. put it back there and had that happen, knew he messed up. He knew what could have happened. He could have he, killed. The, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think it did. I think it did hit somebody that was close, and so they were you know dealing with that wound. I think it was like it wasn't a tragic wound. It was just a yeah 
I think it hit somebody's leg or their arm. And so, you know, we're, they were dealing with that. Someone that was closer to the, I mean, I was, we were literally a hundred, hundred meters away, mm-hmm. you know, well, might've been 50 meters away from where it actually took place. But um, the point there is that they were, there was people closer by than we yeah. were. We were just in the line of fire, but they, you know, they had him set aside. They were talking to him and he was in shock. Yeah, of course. He, he could have killed people, his friends, his comrades. Mm-hmm. He felt terrible mm-hmm. at the same time. That is why we train and train and train and train to keep weapons safe, to make sure that they're, mm-hmm. they're unloaded when they don't, when they don't need to be loaded, to make sure mm-hmm. they're on safe when they don't, when they need to be on safe, to make sure muzzles are faced in the right direction so that an accident can't happen like that. Um, so he was disciplined in that way. And I'm pretty sure he wasn't wearing uniform. I think we flew him out of country, but at that point, it wasn't necessarily because of the discipline. I think it was because he couldn't handle it anymore. Mm-hmm. He knew like it, it his yeah. PTSD from that moment is that he could have killed American soldiers mm-hmm. and that would have been more tragic to him than anything what happens to a person like that when he goes back does he get help probably not i'd like i'd like to think so i'd like to think so um Mm -hmm. it's because it's you know we we all understand that there's negligence and there's negligence involved there right he didn't do it correctly he he had an unsafe he he created an unsafe environment for being uh for not having attention enough to detail to keep his weapon on safe. We're trained so much, so much on keeping your weapon safe, keeping your weapon safe. Your weapon is the thing that will save your life um, or end somebody else's. And so it's mm-hmm. a very powerful tool. Um, it is a, it is a tool, it is a tool of war. That's what it's for. Uh, so when someone messes that up, we do discipline them. And sometimes it's very harsh. Sometimes they go to jail. I mean, it, it's, that's a very, it's, 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 you're supposed to treat that thing as if it could kill anyone at any time every day every single time you use it um but does that person get the same treatment i don't know i hope so i hope that that person gets the same uh mental health you know treatment that we do i would imagine so uh i'm sure that in years past that was not the case i'm sure that you go back a couple of decades and we would have thought about that differently Hmm. very interesting dd what are we doing now we have already 11 on my side 11 20 I'm sorry. Almost. No, no, it's good. Please don't apologize. It's my fault. I could have, <laughs> but it was so interesting. I couldn't stop talking about it. Um, but I definitely would like to talk about gaming a little bit more. Guy, let let yeah. me ask in chat, guys, shall we do a, a second episode only talking about gaming? Um, how he got into gaming, his vote to become an EA game changer, his experience in Sweden, how he got drunk, and Jeff had to drag him home. Um. <laughs> Stop telling that story, Jeff. <laughs> actually, he told Stop me that story, story last year already, but he didn't tell me the name. I actually figured out today the name because he told me last year the story when I was in Sweden. He told her, I I brought a I brought a guy home to the hotel. He was so drunk, <laughs> but he never told me it was you. That was funny. Um, I didn't think I was that drunk, but I couldn't stand up straight. And the <laughs> and the, the the streets in Sweden are they're weird and, and yeah, like rocking, you know, it's like mm-hmm. come on. <laughs> they they don't live in the in the in the modern world in Sweden, you know. <laughs> they just they just have there's more verticality. It's just like the it's like so <laughs> they curve and they go down this way and that, and then there's like cobblestones or brick road, and it's like uh, don't blame the I was, streets. I was right? definitely drunk. Exactly. No, I'm not gonna blame the streets. Jet. Je- you guys, you guys know, a lot of you guys know Jeff Gagne, right? I mean, the guy's a wonderful human being, uh, a very Jeff cool Gagne. guy. Jeff yeah. Gagne, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so mm. question, guys, shall we do a second stream or shall we just, you know, try to talk like a little bit more about gaming now? Do you do you have more time, guys? Well, no, no, not Jeff Braddock. Uh, Jeff, Jeff no, Gagne. Jeff I, got some, I, I got some drunken stories of Jeff Braddock, too, by the way, which I will not share because. What? Is, no, nope, <laughs> absolutely not. There are some what 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 stays in a Jeff Braddock interaction stays spectrum. in a Jeff Braddock interaction. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, well, if we want to talk about gaming for a little bit and then just see where that goes, and then uh, mm-hmm. if people are okay with that, and then I, you know, if there's something yeah. that comes, from are you this okay that with that, guys? I definitely have time, and I'm I'm fit enough to do a little bit more tonight. <coughs> Part two would be amazing. Happy other way. Well, then let's let's do another twenty minutes or so, if, if that's okay. okay for you guys. Um, yeah. Let's get into gaming. How? When did you get into gaming? How did you get into gaming? Do you remember actually your first game you you played? I was. I would like to start there. Actually, Pac Man. Pac Man. Oh. Yep. I was. Uh, I think I was three or four, and they had an Atari twenty six hundred, 
uh, and there was Pac-Man. It was only like two games. It was like Pac-Man and Pitfall, I think. Uh, and I played Pac-Man. And I remember, I remember, I remember this. You know, some memories you have when you're like three or four, uh, they're just like a clip from a like a clip. Mm -hmm. You don't know the whole. But I remember playing Pac-Man, and I was doing very well and playing this game with this little, you know, this wiggle in this stick and hitting this thumb button. And I heard my mom or my aunt behind me who were my aunts were teenagers. And my mom was, well, she was like, you know, 22 at that time. It's like, man, he's just so good. And I remember that's, I remember them saying that, but I'm like, so good at what, this is a dumb game. And I'm, you know, whatever, because mm -hmm. video games are still kind of new. Uh, and then, you know, I, you know, multiple other games throughout, you know, I, I started with the Atari and, you know, then I got an NES and then, uh, after the NES was my Super Nintendo and then the Nintendo 64. Once I was in the army and I can buy my own stuff, I bought a Nintendo 64 and I bought a PlayStation, the OG PlayStation. And I was, you know, Tomb Raiding my butt off and Nintendo 64. I was Goldeneye and my butt off and I loved Goldeneye. Uh, that was the, like all the people, all the guys would come to the barracks room and we'd all play Goldeneye together, you know, on the big, on a, on a screen with, you know, four ways, you know, uh, you know, and just continued on through there. And then, uh, when I was in Hawaii, uh, after I got back from Iraq, I met some other guys that wanted to play a game called Counter-Strike. The little game of Counter-Strike, you may have heard of it. I'm not sure. Um, most mm -mm. people have never heard of that game. So, But we were playing this game, and we decided, hey, let's set up a server for this. And we set up one of the largest uh, servers, the, the largest server in Hawaii and one of the largest servers on the West Coast of the United States because we had Californians playing with us all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we played. We had a Counter-Strike server that we ran. Uh, and then when I... Got tired of Counter-Strike, and I was like, I can't play this anymore, and I'm tired of running servers for this. We went, and I started playing Battlefield 1942, which some of you guys might have, might have seen this once or twice before, Ooh, but I still have. Wait, put it a little bit to the middle. Nice. Is It's even signed? Yes. Damn. And guess, who, guess whose signature that is? Well, I guess it's uh, Mr. Um, yeah. Himself. Mr. Battlefield? Mr. Battlefield? Lars Gust Lars Gustafson. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and he and he was he was so excited to sign it, and and he signed it in Stockholm at the Dice Studios. Uh, but I still have the discs from my G42, and then we started playing something called uh, uh, mo uh, it was Night Battlefield 1942 Desert Combat Mod. So mm -hmm. the Desert Combat Mod, we ran a server for that, and I put so much time into server management and playing desert combat and then the guys that made the desert combat mod got hired by dice to go and make and help make battlefield 2 and so those that studio um which i think i think they are now <clears throat> i was thinking about things. i was just thinking about like i think jack Frax played a very old battlefield uh, a few weeks ago was it was it actually this desert mode? It might I have think, been. I think I it saw him playing that. That was very interesting, and it <laughs> and I was wondering like it still looks so great, like even though it's so old, I think it still looks for that. It looks really great. I really want to. I I I've been joking for years that I'm going to set up a battlefield community server for 1942 Desert Combat because it's all you can go find the files out there. It's not supported anymore, mm -hmm. uh, but you can you know you can fly the C-130. Yeah, like you could literally fly the C-130. Mm -hmm. Like that used to be a thing. Uh, to be a good C-130 pilot, you'd have four people spawn, and then you could use the guns, the howitzer, and everything else. And so you had to fly around the map at an angle, like they fly a C-130, uh, like a like a Spectre gunship. And they would. So it was beautiful. It was wonderful. Um, you fly A-10s and all sorts of other stuff. You had to like go land on the air on the airfield again. You had to like fly over the landing uh, over the uh, the runway to reload your weapons on your mm -hmm. on your aircraft. Mm -hmm. So if you had a helicopter, like a little bird or something, you had to go back to the, you only had a certain amount of ammo in order to get more ammo. You had to go back and, you know, land at the, so it was just, it was the first time I'd played a game where it had such, um, what I thought was really a, like thoughtful gameplay that had realism, but it was still a game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, depth like that. And then so Battlefield 2 and I didn't play much of Battlefield 2 because I was still playing Desert Combat. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, no, I, this is we're still playing this. Um, I moved on. I played WoW for a long time. I played WoW for about 10 years, actually. Um, uh, probably from... I played WoW from 2006 to... Well, 2004 to 2011, 2010. So I guess it wasn't 10 years. It was about six, mm -hmm. six years or so. I just tried to but, remember <clears throat> it. Yeah, okay. 
because I, I stopped playing WoW at Old War. But I got very good at that. I was, you know, doing, you know, world clear stuff and uh, I got very involved in that. WoW is where I realized that gaming is a great asset and I love it, but it's also a lot of work if you're trying to manage communities. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk away from WoW because I was literally coming home from work, you know, making dinner, cracking a beer, firing up WoW and going back to work. Because I had to lead a raid, I had to teach people how to do and then it new stops raid being content, fun. and it stopped being fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so I met my wife uh, as I was retiring from the military. I met my wife. Uh, so as I was, you know, I was being told I was, you know, we can't keep you. We're gonna have to disability retire you. I met her, and I think I stopped playing WoW right about the time uh, I decided to ask her to move in with me. So um, it just worked out for her because I didn't play video games as much for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but so after that, a uh, couple of years later, you know, I'm back, you know, finding some games like Battlefield. I played, uh, you know, a bunch of Steam games. I played uh, um, uh, not not Dead by Daylight. It was uh, uh, what's the zombie game that's on Steam that had had a sequel and there's now a new game being made. What is it called? I'm going to have to open up Steam just to tell you. You yeah. had four players. You had four. You, it was four on four. There was four, uh, uh, four zombies and four Left for Dead. Thank left you, Kelly. Left for Dead. So Left for Dead and Left for Dead Thanks, Two. Kelly. I probably have. Yeah, I probably have like fifteen hundred hours in those games. I mean, it's I played those so much, uh, and then that was like how, that was where. I, so my gaming time was kind of private then, and I wasn't hanging out with a lot of people. It wasn't much community. There was some, and then I said, you know, I really miss the community aspect, and I became a part of uh, Clan Angels of Death. Uh, back in 2000 and AOD yeah ah, yeah I'm one of the, you... I'm... okay okay yeah yeah I'm mm -hmm. still one of the senior administrators mm -hmm. there for yeah. Clan Angels Death I uh, I helped them grow their battlefield uh, which is again how I got into the game changers program was partially because I was having the Dice LA studios uh, on Friday nights come into our team speak and play with a hundred of our other you know uh, game gamers for battlefield for mm -hmm. for battlefield four and for battlefield one so we kind of got our start there. Then I started streaming. Um, and then... Which year was that? Oh, that would have been 2000 and... Where, what are we, 2021 now? 2014? 14. And when you started streaming, how serious were you about it? Not at all. I, when I first started streaming, it was literally about uh, raising money for Battlefield servers from our community. It wasn't about anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became about, well, this was fun and I really enjoyed it. And I wanted to keep my public speaking skills, right? Because I, I've, 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 I've talked to generals and politicians and rooms full of hundreds of soldiers and civilians. Um, I've talked to mayors and councils. I've been on the news. I've, mm -hmm. I've done stuff like this. And I wanted to keep my public speaking skills mm -hmm. and practice that and be on camera and be able to be an authentic human being and do that. And from there, I decided I liked this. I loved streaming. I loved talking to chat. I love answering questions. I love playing games and just having fun and being able to be the most authentic me that I can be. Because as far as I can tell, at 44 and a half years old, the most authentic me that I am is when I'm live enjoying myself. If I'm playing something that I'm really into, that's very thoughtful or very fun, and I get to be silly and unfiltered and just go with it that's who that's who i want to be i'm the person i want to be all the time while i'm streaming so i miss that i miss that and i want to go back to it all of that to say that's how i got into the ea game chambers you know i was on the battlefield stream team all of that stuff kind of grew from all of that multiple trips to stockholm and london and la and all of that wonderful cool stuff uh and now now i just work with you guys i work with content creators and with uh, other people that stream for a bet for a higher purpose, you know, than myself. And I don't, you know, I haven't really had it in my head to stream because it's hard to be, if you're not, if you can't be your most authentic self, it's really kind of bullshit to turn on a camera and fake that. <laughs> and 2020 for me and a lot of people suck. It just sucked so bad. And I, I could not stand, I, I would not have wanted to watch me last year because I just was such a, in a bad mental space. I just didn't really have it to give to anybody else. I needed it from other people. So I had to watch other content creators. I had to get that from someone else. 
um, when it came to that. But it, it worked with my work. It worked with what we do. It allowed me to create some great relationships and do some good in the world mm -hmm. while I wasn't able to do it on my own. So when you started streaming and you thought about like um, the, the beginning, did you ever look up to any other streamer and who were these streamers and why did you look up to them? Yeah, probably the most notable ones, uh, still friends to this day, for sure, uh, were Prophet on Fire, now Fireborn. Um, mm -hmm. now Fireborn. One, one, of, one, of the, one of the best friends I think I've made in the, in, in the, in the gaming world. Um, I've, made, I've made lots of very good friends in the gaming world. I mean, I even, I've, I've met people in real life and stayed on their couch in states that I don't live in. I mean, this is, you know, you get to know the gaming world is not so, uh, so weird and crazy. Um, Necro is probably the, the second guy that I, that I discovered that we were so, we had so much in common and I got very, I could be very good friends with Necro and, and, and Fireborn, uh, back, uh, during the day, Grizzle, BF, uh, Avalence, uh, which is a friend of Prophets for a long time. Uh, and then I've got a lot of other folks that I've known that aren't from the Battlefield community that I've gotten to know from working with Stacka. I've got mm -hmm. some folks that came from the Mixer world, you know, I've got like Metro mm -hmm. Birdman, a reanimator and, Uh, some of these other fantastic, you know, Winter's Wolf Cry I just met uh, a couple years ago, and he's now doing charity work for us as well. There's some just really great people out there that are good humans. You know, not everybody that you see on TV or streaming or on YouTube is probably a good, I'm not going to say they're all bad people in the background, but you don't know. Yeah. You get to know some of these people and you're like, oh man, we're, we can be actual friends because you're a decent human being. I, you know, as, as opposed to a character, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like Fireborn is not a character. That's him. That's, that's Titus. That's, that's who he is. You know, Necro is not a character. Mm -hmm. That's, that's him. That's who he is. He's a great guy. It's like, and he has a lot of fun and I really love that. Um, TBM, there he is. There's the, there's the broken machine. Uh, hey, hey, broken. How you doing? <clears throat> so broken and I actually played together on a squad for battlefield five squads, right? It was me, uh, him, uh, Da narwhal dave um oh who is the other one i can't remember we had another guy that played with us but it's funny i got stuck on a team with three brits <laughs> so i was the one american guy playing with three bits on that uh, on that one but um i've met <laughs> from sweden memes <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah it, man, uh, the second time i got to go to stockholm there was a lot of game changers there uh which is i think what what uh, what, what broken machines talking about there We had a lot of game changers that second round uh, in Sweden for that that first closed door event before we came back. It was, man, we had two full rooms. We probably had 128 game changers. What? There were two full rooms of there was two servers like they, they, we played on. There were two full rooms at that place that we played Battlefield Five, so that everybody can collect their content. And it was a lot of fun. Um, so many really cool people <clears throat> and doing. Getting to go to some of those events for someone who's as small, like as small of a broadcaster or content creator as I was, was like, oh my God, like I'm meeting these people with these names that are just, uh, who are you? Like I, I met the, you guys know who Drifter is, right? Drifter is a, a you know, streamer, YouTuber. Yeah. Um, I didn't see him actually for a while. Last time I saw him was uh, when uh, the guys were still playing Firestorm. I actually didn't see him for a while now. Yeah, I, I well, he had some uh, legal things happen in his life that I know he took a step back from. Um, he was mm -hmm. doxxed and he had to, you know, he had a, uh, he had someone try to, what do they call that? Uh, when you, oh, what is that called? It's DDoS? a horrible thing. No, DDoS? not DDoS. It's when they, when they swatted. Uh, swatted, swatted is when someone, someone calls the police and, and tells them that something bad is happening at a, at a oh, streamer's house. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard that. that is, so he that went through horrible. some, yeah, it's, it's disgusting. It's It disgusting is. that someone would 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 stoop that low to anything, and that has actually killed people. That has gotten people killed. Yeah, I know. That that has gotten gamer just gamers and streamers killed. Um, but Drifter, I met Drifter uh, at an LA once, uh, and he may not remember me, but uh, he looks just like my little brother. He they they look like they literally doppelgangers. Mm -hmm. um, but he he was talking to Prophet on Fire, and Prophet on Fire was like, "Hey man, they're BSing," and I'm standing there like, and I saw his his name tag, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" And he's like, "Who are you?" And I, I covered up my name tag. I'm like, "I'm nobody," and so he grabbed my name tag. He's like, "You're not nobody, man. You're deity." I was like, "Oh my god, thank you for saying that." It was just really neat because you know, 
uh, or like the you know Doctor Disrespect. I'm sitting next to next to Fireborn one mm -hmm. day at you know another year or two later playing Battlefield Five. Uh, you know one, one of the maps. I think Merida is what we're testing, and we're sitting there and. Here comes the doc walking in, all in character, looking at everybody. And I wasn't streaming, but Fireborn was. They let us stream. Mm -hmm. And Doc's like, he gets down, he looks at him, he's like, what do you got going on here? You streaming? Who's this? What do you got? What's your name? Right on. Hey, chat. What's going on, chat? It was just so fun. Just some neat experiences that I would have never gotten to have, you know, yeah, ever. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That are, that are good memories there. And this is uh, the stuff, a, you know, this is the stuff we could talk about like two hours more. but Yeah, we won't. But we can't tonight, guys. Really, we can't. We will. We will make uh, uh, another date, um, and so and, and and figure out about um, what we want to talk about gaming stuff and as well. I thought we could. I thought we could do all that once tonight, but it just didn't work. And I think it was good that we didn't do it because it was so important to talk about all the the other stuff tonight. I think. Um, I gotta say, I wanna I wanna thank you for just kind of opening up the idea of having conversation greater than. A qu just a quick script of ABC uh, because again, there's things that you allowed me to say that I kind of needed to say. It was almost like, I know this is for you guys, but honestly, I kind of got something just like I got something out of us, our conversation this weekend. Mm -hmm. I like, I told you, I was like, Oh my God. So uh, Mizzy was like, Oh, I need somebody positive to come on the show. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure you got the right person because I'm not positive right now. I'm like, my world is not the best. I'm not in the right headspace. You kind of got the wrong person, but we <laughs> talked and it was so refreshing to actually get to say things. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I needed to talk about this stuff out loud. Mm -hmm. Like my, my wife and I talk about some of the things that we've been going through, but it's like, we just kind of feel sheltered, but, um, and then it, everybody has their own stuff, but you gave me a little bit of a platform And I know we were talking about mental health and some other things, but this actually was a benefit to Sean's mental health, to be honest, to talk about some of these things mm -hmm. with you guys, to share some of these things that I don't share regularly. Um, and for Mizzy to actually extract, like, mm -hmm. so she was doing this this weekend. She was like pulling, she's like, what about this? And what, what do you mean by that? What do you, I was like, oh, I know. I never thought about it. Let, let me think about it. I should okay, have recorded I that. I should have recorded our first. Time. It was a good conversation. It was a really good conversation. Yeah. Damn it. Well, you can't have everything, but it was, it was worth it. Definitely was. And I really enjoyed it. Do you have well, like, thank you uh, so much. no, thank you, man. Thank you also all in chat. Also, I'm so sorry. I kind of didn't pick up everything you said in chat. It just uh, didn't feel right at the moment because I didn't want to break up the conversation we had in here. Um, but thank you for opening up. I think there was like, I uh, can't find the name right now. Pat man, Pat, Pat said something about like he, um, he was diagnosed with P PTSD And uh, he got help from a psych, psych help me with the word, psychiatrist, psychiatrist, psychiatrist. Thank you. Um, I would have, I would have said shrink like <laughs> shrink is so much easier for me. Um, yeah. And I missed, uh, I missed, I missed something. I probably missed a few things. I'm, I apologize. I apologize. I can't find it right now. Damn, so much activity in chat. Thank you, guys. Really, thank you for all your input again. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for, for sharing, for, for laughing with us. Um, really, thank you. Much appreciated.